Baptist in their somewhat Socratic dialogue <coughs> on ANT, and the other one, Social Theory and Philosophy for Information Systems, which is an energy book which I did with uh, John Hinkers. It gives you a flavour for how we feel that this is at the core of trying to understand information communication technologies. And certainly our PhD programme comes up time and again with, uh, with uh, a lot of philosophy at the heart of PhD proposals. And which brings me on to our, uh, the first person we, I need to mention, Peter Edley, um, who is the inspiration for this event. Um, uh, I knew I was into something interesting when I was reading his PhD major upgrade document and found on an early page a matrix that consisted of Heidegger's fourfold for which he was going to use to analyse implementing ICTs in small and medium enterprises. <laughs> from this you might ass- assess that, that Peter is rather good at synthesis. And he also got extremely interested in, in uh, Graham Harmon's work uh, and the synthesis between Heidegger, Latour, and, 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 and Graham Harmon. And, and that is why we're in, in this fragile position today, uh, talking about the metaphysics um, of the Prince of Network Bruno Latour. The second person I would need to mention is, is Bruno Latour himself. Um, I, I'm not going to repeat any plaudits uh, for Bruno. Uh, you know his work even better than I, I suspect. One thing I do know about Bruno is that he has a very good sense of humour, which I hope will come to the fore today. Um, I, I, I recall, or recall, remember back in Cambridge 1996 when he was asked about actor network theory and he remarked that he wished that ideas had the same, uh, rec- could, could have the same recall notice that uh, Ford motor cars had when they're faulty. Uh, but alas, ideas don't have, uh, re- can't have recall notices. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Bruno, uh, today, because of the work of Graham Harmon, I suspect your ideas on better physics don't have recall notices either, because there's, there's a rather permanent text here that's been written. I, I, I'm sure Graham will explain why it's, he's called uh, Bruno the Prince of Networks and not the Emperor or, or King later on. I'm sure there's a, a rationale for that. Um, and um, the major debate, I think, is going to be around this manuscript today. Um, I've read it. I find it delightful and easy to read, which I can't always say about books on metaphysics or books on Bruno Latour. Uh, uh, so uh, that brings us to the last subject, or is it object, that I need to mention, which is metaphysics itself. I was thinking, how did you introduce uh, the subject of metaphysics? And and I I went back to one of my favourite films as a boy, which was called Scaramouche. You might recall this. It has Stuart Granger in it. uh, To revenge a terrible family wrong, he decides he's going to have to become the best fencer in France. And so he's in training for this. And uh, and the the man's training him to fence, and uh, he knocks the sword out of his hand. And... What's the learning point about that? Well, the learning point about that is, according to the sensory master, um, a sword is like a little bird. If you hold it too tight, you crush it. If you uh, hold it too loosely, it flies away. And I suspect metaphysics is a bit like that. And hopefully that's the dilemma we're going to be in in the next three or four hours when we talk about the prince of networks, who's going to tour, and metaphysics. Hand over today. Okay, thank you very much, Lindsay, for that uh, introduction to both the group uh, and to the event. My role is uh, an enviable one of trying to keep these two gentlemen to an approximate uh, time uh, constraint. Our main time constraint is like uh, Those of you who were there for Bruno's talk last night appreciate that he got about two thirds of the way through the presentation, so I will try to keep both speakers approximately. Uh, to their time subject to lunch and the finishing at the end of uh, the, the, the session. The format is, as Leslie suggested, very much a discussion around uh, Graham's review of Bruno's empirical uh, metaphysics. So we'll start with Graham presenting uh, the key themes of the book. Bruno will have a, a, a chance to respond. Graham will then respond back. And then we'll open it up to audience questions, uh, comments, and discussion. I know that a number of you have already forwarded particular questions that the speakers and the panellists have uh, had a chance to think about, so some of those might be addressed explicitly in the presentation, 
questions might be might be raised in the audience questions, and if not, then we'd also ask the panelists in their discussion after lunch to also particularly come up on and deal with any of these particular questions uh, that might uh, still be remain or might want uh, answered. The only practical thing that people need to know about toilets, there are toilets out by where we had coffee, but there are also some closer toilets to the tents just outside where they used to have them. Uh, just on. First, maybe I'll address questions about the title of the book and also the status of the manuscript. Uh, as you may have noticed, the final chapter is missing, and that's not accidental. I deliberately chose to wait until after this event to write the chapter, and so the things you say today could make a contribution to the manuscript, which is already under review, but I'm still going to make some quite a few changes to it. Uh, King of Networks was the title of the first paper I ever wrote about Bruno Latour. Uh, this was some, a talk I gave in Chicago almost nine years ago, and some of the audience members afterwards said, oh, you ought to send it to Latour himself. Sometimes you'd be surprised. These people will respond. And I sent it, and I got a wonderful response, and this began our correspondence. But then when I tried to keep this title for the manuscript, uh, there were a lot of jokes about this film, King of New York, and I decided I didn't want to deal with any of those jokes when the book was up. And so then it was between Emperor and Prince, and Emperor is simply too polysyllabic. <laughs> and I didn't think Bruno would be offended by Prince as though it were a downgrade, and it does refer to Machiavelli, and Prince of Network sounds enough like Prince of Darkness to be <laughs> flattering in a backhanded way. Um, I'd like to thank, above all, everyone from Anthem who made this happen. And Anthem stands for Actor Network Theory Hiding a Meeting. It's a great acronym. And uh, this is a good match for me because, of course, half of my head feels like Latour and half of my head feels like Heidegger in Phenomenology. And those two usually do not go together. In fact, until I met these people, I thought I was uniquely quirky in some sense. It's not to the others as quirky as I am. And in fact... Uh, Peter and I, he doesn't know this, but I checked this morning, and since August, uh, we exchanged 796 emails, <laughs> many of them about this event. That's over four per day. He's one of the few who likes discussing these things by email as much as I do. And the last preliminary thing I wanted to say is that the, the date of this conference has a lovely symmetry for me, because February of 1988, that's 20 years ago, is when I became a Heideggerian. Day? Specific day? Not specific. I don't remember the specific day of that. It was late February. <laughs> February of 1998 is when I became a Latourian. And here we are today, ten years after that. I'd have been delighted, of course, if I could have looked ten years into the future at that time and see what was coming today. And I wouldn't trade Bruno Latour's presence today for Martin Heidegger's. He's a much nicer man. <laughs> much funnier and a better interlocutor, I'm sure. So what draws a Heideggerian to Latour, since Heidegger is in the background of this manuscript? Well, in my case, it was Heidegger's weaknesses that drew me to Latour, because Latour does not share those weaknesses. Above all else, despite my enthusiasm for Heidegger for many years, his tone was always unbearable to me. It was never anything more for me than something to be endured. A kind of grim piety, this oracular heaviness that is found in all of Heidegger's work. I, I always appreciated the depth of his work, but never appreciated the rhetorical tone. Whereas Bruno is probably the funniest contemporary philosopher, as Leslie already mentioned. Uh, I've got Ha ha and laughter marks made throughout the margins of all of my copies of Bruno's books. Um, and in fact, I was talking to Gerard de Vries in, in Amsterdam, one of the leading Dutch Latourians, and I asked him what drew him to Latour's work, and he said that Bruno and his friends were the only funny people in philosophy. <laughs> Most philosophers were a drag, and he didn't like spending time with them, but Bruno was the exception. Uh, but second, and even more importantly, beyond the question of tone, there is the fact that Bruno's philosophy is almost the only one available in the past century that takes individual objects seriously. Individual objects play a role in his philosophy. In Heidegger, that isn't the case, because individual objects are ontic. What's real is the depth behind those uh, present-at-hand configurations. In Husserl, you do have individual things, but they're phenomena. They're phenomena in consciousness. They don't really do anything. And in other contemporary philosophies, you find that the role of the object is minimalized. Objects don't really do anything. Um, one of my favorite moments when we brought Bruno to Egypt four years ago was his lecture on how the price of apricots in Paris is determined, uh, which is something that I, I cannot imagine Heidegger or most others attempting as a philosophical topic. So what are these individual things for Bruno Latour? We need to look at the reductions. One of his most underread books, which is uh, often hidden because it's not a book in its own right. It's the second half. It's a large appendix to the book on Pasteur, which is better known, I think. And... When I first contacted Bruno about this project, I don't know, three or four years ago, and told him what I had in mind, 
he said that, uh, as I mentioned in the manuscript, that any discussion of his philosophy must begin with the reductions, which he said had never been reviewed once, surprisingly, until now. And although this can't really be called an authorized book, because I think he disagrees with much of it, uh, the structure is due to Bruno Latour himself. He's the one who, who maybe seriously think that reduction should provide the structure for the entire book, which it is. It's his own fault. And I would say, as I've mentioned in the, in the book, that there are probably four major concepts in reductions. First of all, there's irreduction itself, which he presents in his wonderful Paul on the Road to Damascus style, this revelation he had when he was 24 or 25 years old, when he claims he had to pull over the van, and he's, he actually went back and found his diary entry and typed it out for me. Very dramatic moments, uh, uh, when he decided that what, what most theories share in common is, is a desire to reduce things to something else, take some primary reality that explains the others and use that to explain the rest. And, uh, Bruno Latour rejected this at a young age, and this does ally him with Heidegger's critique of ontotheology, theology, by the way. Uh, this criticism of the notion that any one particular kind of being can explain being itself. So that is one link between them. Second, actors, probably the most important concept of his philosophy. Actors uh, are obviously different from traditional substances, which is the most famous version of objects in the history of philosophy, because first of all, they're of all sizes. Uh, the LSE can be an actor, an atom can be an actor, this piece of paper can be an actor. He's not distinguishing between substance and aggregates, the way that even Leibniz states, where a circle of men holding hands cannot possibly be a substance, because those are simply an aggregate of many individuals. For the Torah, every individual is already an aggregate anyway, and uh, we saw this in a le- nice lecture last night on Tagd, very well described again last night as usual. Uh, so you cannot say an actor is simple. For the Torah, it can be of any size. It doesn't have to endure. Actors can, in fact, actors do not endure at all for him. We'll see in a second. It doesn't, doesn't matter that they're eternal. Uh, they're not eternal. Substances were usually supposed to be eternal. The difference between real and unreal is not important. Harry Potter can be an actor for Bruno Latour as much as a piece of granite. Uh, anything that has an effect on other things is an actor. So there's no difference between physical and non-physical actors. Each actor is a black box containing other actors at infinitum. And all actors are equally real. But, the third point, alliances, not all actors are equally strong. The fact that an actor is real does not mean it's as convincing as others. He is not a relativist. Anything does not go. Uh, some actors are simply very weak. Not much proof can be mustered on their behalf. Not many allies rush to their aid. Whereas some uh, actors are very real because other allies recognize them as real and respond to them and have to alter their trajectories to, to uh, adapt to them. And finally, translation. Which uh, the idea that one thing can never be completely translated into another place or time, you're always going. There's always going to be an information loss, an energy loss. You have to pay a price to translate something from one place to another. Uh, and this comes out especially wonderfully in his brilliant alternative model of truth, which I don't think we've ever seen before from any philosopher. Usually there are these disputes over the correspondence version of truth, where the mind is copying the world, or the coherence view of truth, where you're just trying to make sure your views are, are consistent with each other. What we get in Bruno Latour and Pandora's Hope is the industrial model of truth, which is one of my favorite parts of his work. It's in order to get the oil trapped in the geological seams of Saudi Arabia into the gas tank in France, you're not copying it. And it's not just coherence. I mean, there is a real thing there that you have to, to translate at each sta- stage. I don't even know all the stages. You have to refine it. You have to put it on a ship and take it to Europe. You have to turn it into petrol somehow. somehow. I don't know how that happens. And then finally it has to be sold to the person and go into the gas tank. And if you think of truth as this sort of process, it opens up a lot of new possibilities uh, for philosophy. The other thing about actors is that there is no hidden essence or potential in the actors. You cannot say that the the actors have some inner hidden kernel which is more important than some sort of accidental crust. Uh, Actors contain all of their features. An actor simply is what it is, which means an actor contains all of its qualities, an actor contains all of its relations with other actors. There is nothing hiding behind those things. An actor is fully deployed in the world in every second. There's no cryptic reservoir hiding behind what the thing is doing here and now and what qualities the thing has here and now. Uh, the reality of the actor is its way of perturbing, transforming, and jostling other things. Now, here's the paradox. And by paradox, I don't mean contradiction. I don't mean I mean, gotcha. Uh, any philosophy is real only when it has a paradox. Who is it who said that paradox is the mark of truth? I think that's Count York quoted in Being in Time by Heidegger. And uh, Aristotle even says that substance is that which can have different qualities at different times. Something is more substantial if it's capable of more paradoxical properties. Uh, On the one hand, Bruno Latour is clearly a philosopher of relations. 
This whole philosophy is about relations, the way that things interact, the way things form networks, they form alliances and relations. And yet, since everything happens in one time and one place only, and every actor is utterly concrete, this means that actors are completely cut off from each other as well. Everything is completely cut off in its own self, and as we'll see in a second, it can't possibly endure from one instant to the next, because it's so utterly concrete that even the smallest change in it essentially makes it a new actor, unless some other actor does work to establish that the change wasn't that important and it's actually the same thing. But it requires another actor to do that. Nothing endures. Everything is a perpetual perishing. It's like Whitehead and it's also like the occasionalists. And I'm going to come up to that in a minute as well. Actually, I'm going to come up to that right now. I didn't realize that was the next card. There's a growing tendency to hear people say that there's this school of process philosophy and you hear Whitehead, Bergson, Deleuze, Latour sometimes grouped together. And I can see why people say that, because what all of those names have in common is that they don't accept the traditional models of substance. That's true. However, it's a bit sloppy to put those names together uh, for a reason that becomes pretty obvious if you look at the underpinnings of their philosophies. You have to put Bruno Latour with Whitehead if you're going to group those together, because what matters for them, for Latour and Whitehead, are individual actors in individual instances. There is no flux, there is no becoming, there is no elan vital as separate realities for the two and whiteheads. Time is produced for these two by actors. It's produced, it's, time is a result, it's not a starting point, it's not a force. Individual actors, for, for Bruno, create time by doing something that's irreversible. The example you were giving at dinner last night, the Fermat's theorem sat around for however many centuries, nothing happened, and now it's solved. A cut has been made, something irreversible has happened. Time, is, time has been created by an actor, and the wise. Um, Whitehead even emphasizes this terminologically. He talks about actual entities, but he also calls them actual occasions. Because an actual entity is frozen in an instant. Once, once it's altered, it's not really the same thing. You can try to create enduring new entities in Whitehead at the level of societies or a higher level. When you talk about actual entities, they're perishing. He says in a famous and wonderful phrase, they do not undergo adventures in space and time. They exist in one place and time only, just as Bruno. Let me go back and say a little about the history of occasionism. Uh, because it's a neglected, neglected but extremely important trend in the history of philosophy, and I think one that still dominates us, and I'm going to write something about this later, but occasionalism goes back to Islamic philosophy. People usually think of 17th century France, but it actually goes back to Islamic theology fairly early in the so-called Asherite school, which for theological motives did not want to give the ability to act to created substances. Only Allah could have the power to create or even to cause anything to happen at all. For them, they were so extreme that even to give uh, fire the power of burning cotton was a kind of blasphemous act. And this is why God had to come in as a a mediator. God is the mediator for all interactions. And this, to me, is the key contribution of Islamic philosophy. There's there's every so often an attempt to revive Islamic philosophy and certain texts are retranslated or commented upon too often it gets stuck in the rut of just saying, well, we owe the, we owe the Arabs keeping Aristotle alive or something like that. What really happens is that uh, occasionalism comes to be at the very hearts of Western philosophy. It takes a while to get to the West. Uh, notice that for Aristotle and his tradition, there, causation isn't really a problem. There are no gaps between things. I mean, he's got the four causes, final, formal, efficient, material. But it's not really a problem for Aristotle that one thing touches another. This took a theological motive to say that one, how can one thing touch another at all? This is impossible. God must be the mediator. Um, for Descartes, the motive is different. Uh, the motive is that you have two different kinds of substances. You have the mind and the body. The only way for the mind to cause the body to move would be for God to serve as the mediator. So in a way, that's almost less interesting than the... the Muslim position on occasionalism, but that Muslim position on occasionalism was brought back right away by Cordemont and Malebranche, for whom interaction between individual bodies is already a problem again, because they brought back the theory of atoms, unlike Descartes. And so the interaction of physical atoms requires God's mediation as well for them. And I would go so far as, I I think the term occasionalism is used far too restrictively. Sometimes historians get very touchy about this, they want to restrict it only to Malebranche and a few others, they don't even want to give it to Descartes. I would call most of these 17th century figures occasionalists, including Leibniz, Spinoza, Locke, not, not Locke, Barclay, not Locke, scratch that, Barclay. Uh, um, so I, I think it's, it's fairly clearly the dominant trend in 17th century metaphysics. Now, of course, no one takes it seriously. It seems like a very dated theology. It's something fun for undergraduates to refute in introductory classes, except, of course, for Whitehead 
who takes pride in beginning his great book by saying, let's forget about Kant and go back to the 17th century. And so then Whitehead is able to walk freely among all these philosophies to take occasionalism seriously. But something that's not laughed at today is skepticism. And Kant has a solution to skepticism. Skepticism is in many ways still the horizon of contemporary philosophy. And so it's, it's taken seriously in the back of everybody's mind almost. And if you think about it, skepticism is really just an upside-down occasionalism. You've got the same problem. The same problem is how can one thing necessarily connect with another. In a way, these two are just the inverse. And it's, it's interesting to note that Hume was a great fan of Malamosh. Uh, he was deeply inspired by him. In occasionalism, the problem is you have these individual substances. You know we have these substances. But how can they touch? There's no way they can touch. That would be blasphemous. So it must be God is making them touch. God comes in as the solution to link substances that exist. In a way, with Hume, what you have is you're simply starting with the relations. Things are already related by habit and custom. I already do link these things together. The problem is saying, how can they exist independently of that? How can we know that they have powers outside of my habitual linking of them that makes them independent? We can't. So, in a way, the human mind, or habit or custom, are simply playing the role for Hume that the occasionalist God plays for all the occasionalists. And so it's, it's, people can laugh at occasionalism all they want, but they're just taking the opposite solution in most contemporary philosophy. So they shouldn't be laughing. They should be trying to reform their own uh, position. Now, the problem with both of these theories is that both share the same flaw. Both of them start off by problematizing relation, specifically causal relation. There's this problem, how can two things relate to each other? And they both cheat. They both solve the problem falsely by imagining one super entity that solves the problem. You know, for the occasionalist, well, nothing can touch, well, God can do it. For, for him, well, nothing can touch, yeah, but they're already linked in the human mind, so it doesn't matter. Uh, by habits. So, in a way, they're both shying away from the real abyss of that problem. How do two things interact at all? Um, and so I would say most post-Kantian philosophy is simply an upside-down occasionalism, insofar as it's re restricting itself to human access to the interaction of things, and not talking about the interaction of things themselves. Now, Whitehead, of course, uh, is always the exception to the rules of a post-Kantian philosophy. Again, Whitehead begins processing reality by simply saying, let's go back to the 17th century. Philosophy has gone downhill since, since Kant. And how do things communicate for Whitehead? You also have this problem that things are actual entities, and they are fully defined by their relations to other things, which he calls prehensions. But how do they prehend each other? Well, they prehend each other by using eternal objects, which can roughly be described as platonic forms, more or less. Things uh, oversimplify each other when they apprehend each other, because they apprehend each other through these, you can call them universal qualities. And these universal qualities have to be somewhere. Where are they? Right, they're in God's mind. So it's the same old solution. It's the, the old occasional solution, which is very refreshing compared to most recent philosophy, but still has the same problem, which is bringing in a kind of magical solution at the end. Now, I think this is the greatness of Latour's metaposition. I think this is a, a real breakthrough that he's made in being the first person to problematize relations and not invent one, one of these magical last-ditch solutions. He's not from the Kantian tradition, so he doesn't make it all in the human mind. He doesn't follow Whitehead in bringing in God to serve this particular causal role in his philosophy. It's a kind of secular occasionalism. We've never seen that before. A philosophy where you have to ask how things interact on a local level without appeal to some all-powerful super-entity that's hidden somewhere from us. He does not flee before the problem of translation. He makes it the theme of his philosophy. All relation for the tour requires a mediator. Uh, any two things can be linked, but only if something links them. In his most wonderful example, uh, politics and neutrons can be linked, but only if Julio in France links them, only if he's able to convince the French government that neutrons are part of their defense policy, and only if he is able to convince neutrons by designing experiments in the right way to give the sorts of results that are, are plausible enough to, to make a working bomb. Uh, it's not God that links politics and neutrons, and it's not the human mind that links them, except that it's Julio. And every actor is a Julio. Uh, any, any entity can link any two other entities. So local occasionalism must be possible. We know that Bruno Latour is a philosopher of actors and networks. We can rewrite that in the terms of saying he is a philosopher of objects and relations. Those are the terms I like to use. And just to review what those mean for him, actors or objects are of all sizes. Uh, they can be both real or unreal in physical terms. Uh, they are black boxes in the sense that you're never going to get to a simple one. You can open up any actor and find many more actors hidden within it. And every actor is involved in larger entities. And as far as relations, we know from the source philosophy that they're 
only occasional. They need a third term, they need a mediator. Something like that. And for, this, for these reasons, I will always be a Victorian. No matter how much he might not like certain parts of the second half of the book, I will always have this Victorian base in my philosophy because Heidegger doesn't give me these things. Uh, Heidegger gives me no real attention to objects at all, and his account of relations isn't really there unless he, human Dasein is the one doing the relating. And so those are things I do not get from Heidegger at all. And Latour has started a style of philosophy in this way that's completely unavailable elsewhere. You're not going to find, even in Whitehead, you're not going to find that because there's always this appeal to the eternal objects and to gods. He's not going to, to look a problem in the face. And of course, Bruno does this with a wit and liveliness that are well worth emulating as much as Heidegger's tone is worth avoiding, at least in my opinion. And I will only pick out four of the things I said in the second half of the book that I think need to be worked on to make the, philosopher, the philosophy of objects and relations feasible. One of them is that given that any two actors can only be linked through a mediator, there's a the possible problem of an infinite regress. If Joliot was required to link neutrons in politics, what links Joliot in neutrons, what links Joliot in politics? Well, you could say Joliot's eyeballs link him with the neutrons, or Joliot's physical training link him with the neutrons, and that's not that interesting, so we don't have to look at that. Yes, if you're looking at this as, a, as an actual analysis of Joliot's life, it's, you can, for, for practical purposes, you can say that's not a very interesting mediation, and so we can avoid it. But in metaphysical terms, it is a problem. You have to explain how any two things can link. And so there must be a space where direct contact is possible without mediation. Uh, that needs to be discovered, what that space is, where, where linkages are possible. Okay, uh, points two and three come from my phenomenological backgrounds, which Bruno Latour does not share. One of them is that my Heideggerian side makes me resist the idea that objects can be their relations. And this is, of course, an unorthodox reading of Heidegger, uh, but the way I read Heidegger's tool analysis, let me summarize this quickly, because maybe not everyone's familiar with Heidegger. I think I have maybe a few more, few more minutes. Okay. Um, Heidegger's tool analysis is meant as a critique of Husserl, who was Heidegger's great teacher. Husserl's goal can roughly be said to be to protect philosophy from the growing advance of the natural sciences. Philosophy in the late 1800s was in danger of becoming experimental psychology. And Husserl's way of preventing this from happening was to say that all these physical theories are just theories. If I hear a door slam, you can invent a theory about vibrations going through the air and coming into my ear and vibrating my eardrum and sending chemical signals up the nervous system, but we don't really have direct access to that. Those theories are grounded in my experience of the door slamming. So what we should do instead is simply describe what, it, what it's like to hear the door slam, what I'm actually hearing, what I'm inferring, what the different layers of sound are that I might not be paying attention to normally. Uh, this is what phenomenological description is about, and it's often accused of becoming a kind of psychology, and it does verge on psychology to some extent. Uh, Heidegger's attack on this was simply to say that our normal, our normal interaction with things is not phenomenal. It's not as images in our consciousness. It's taking things for granted. It's using them. It's relying on things. Uh, our consciousness is a very small percentage of our actual interaction with things at any moment. You are using the floor now to support you. You're using the oxygen to breathe. You're using your bodily organs uh, to keep you alive. And you're not thinking about these things normally unless they break. And so Heidegger's famous tool analysis in Being in Time uh, talks about this disturbance of reference when things malfunction or fail in some way and come to our attention in a way that they didn't before. They're emerging from shadow into lights. And they don't actually have to break for this to happen. You can do this with theoretical consciousness. You can do this simply by talking about something or noticing something. Uh, all these different ways are, show for Heidegger that there's something hidden behind any of our theory or any of our looking. There's this deeper layer. Now, it's sometimes said that this shows that practice comes before theory for Heidegger. Heidegger's a pragmatist. No. Because notice that even our practical use of things does not exhaust them. By sitting on the chair, you're also not coming into contact with all the properties of the chair. The chair has many different qualities, so your sitting does not exhaust any more than you're looking at the chair exhausts. There are tiny electromagnetic vibrations coming off the chair that certain insects might be able to perceive that you cannot, that your body cannot, and they're completely irrelevant to us as humans. But the chair seems to have perhaps an infinity of these qualities that no other entity will ever unlock. And then you have to go a third step and I get this from Whitehead, actually, even before I knew Bruno's work, uh, things do this to each other as well. Things are oversimplifying each other just as much as we do. It's not a special property of human consciousness to distort the worlds. Entities will distort each other, ipso facto, by the mere fact that they relate. For one, for paper to burn, uh, sorry, for fire to burn cotton, which is the favorite Islamic example discussed in all those ancient texts, 
the, the fighter does not need to know, or I wouldn't even say no, the fighter, the fighter does not need to react to most of the properties of the cotton. The, the smell of the cotton, the color of the cotton, these are irrelevant to the fire. It's going to burn it based on flammable, flammable properties, whatever those are. Um, and so the object is deeper, I hypothesize, than any possible relations to it. If you say that an object is reducible to its relations to other things, which I know Bruno holds, I think there are a couple of other problems. Uh, one problem is I don't think you can explain change, and this is something Aristotle says against the Megarians in the metaphysics. If there's no potential, I also, I'm also against potential, but I think there has to be something outside of things' relations. Uh, uh, if a thing is nothing outside of its current relations, why would it ever change its relations? If I am completely exhausted by my current state of relations to all of you and everything in the world, there's nothing hidden in reserve, there's nothing cryptic, there's nothing that would later unfold and give me the chance to have new relations to things. The other, so, so in a way, it doesn't do justice to my future. And in a way, it can't even explain my presence, because we can imagine a counterfactual situation in which other people would be sitting in this room who aren't here, who will be seeing me from different angles and having different reactions to me than any of you do, and they would still be reacting to me. They would not be reacting to your relations to me. So there is something here that's to me that these people are encountering. I'm not just the sum total of the way that I relate to them. Um, okay, so that's, that's the second point I want to make. I only have two more. The other uh, thing that, that Bruno does in his philosophy is identifies an object with its qualities, not just with its relations, but also with its qualities. You cannot say that an object is different from its qualities. Whereas for Husserl, here's my, my phenomenological background coming in, I would say that Husserl's primary insight is the distinction between a thing and its qualities. Now, people often dismiss Husserl. He's just an idealist. He's taking us back to the cards and comp. It's not quite that simple. Yes, Husserl is an idealist. Yes, he does bracket the real world. But notice that when you're reading Husserl, it feels like realism. There's a, there's a taste of realism in your mouth when you're reading Husserl. Anyway, even though he's an idealist. Now, why is that? It's because Husserl is talking about objects. They're just not real objects that have independent force. They're called intentional objects. Husserl spends a whole semester having his students analyze a mailbox in a famous example. You cannot imagine Fichte or Hegel spending a whole semester having their, con- uh, their students analyze a mailbox. It would make no sense for them. An object has no opacity, no resistance for those old German idealists. It's simply one transient moment of dialectic and then it's gone. You're onto some higher structure. Individual objects have a kind of potency and a kind of weight and an obscurity for Husserl already, even though they're not real, even though they're in the human mind. If you circle a, a building, you keep thinking of it as, as the same building, even though you're seeing utterly different qualities at each instance. Which means there's a distinction between the building and the qualities by which it's manifest. Those qualities are almost accidental. You just need to be seeing some qualities of it to know that you're seeing it. But you can keep circling it and it stays the same. It stays identical. Even if it's not real. Even if it's the tooth fairy you're circling in your mind. The same thing happens. Now, this is important because this is Husserl's challenge to the entire tradition of British empiricism, which is often very much taken for granted. The idea that a thing is nothing more than a bundle of qualities put together. There's nothing called thing that's independent of those. Locke says it, Hume says it. Uh, there's this mockery of the I know not what. They say, I know not what, and they're, they're saying that sarcastically. All we really know are the qualities. Well, for Husserl, no, the qualities come first. And in one of Husserl's followers, like Merleau Ponty, there are no qualities independent of the thing. Black is a different black, even if you're looking at the exact same wavelength of black. If you're looking at ink, a shirt, a flag, the black is different in each of those cases because it's somehow impregnated with the underlying objects which is never fully present to you. Um, and on, th- on this point, Bruno is on the side of the British empiricists. There's also this whole debate in the philosophy of language, which is, has been very central for analytic philosophy, between uh, uh, Russell and Frege, who uphold the traditional view that a person's name is simply an abbreviation for all the qualities we know about them. And then on the opposite side, Kripke, who says, no, the name, you're pointing at something that's deeper than the qualities. Why? Because you can, I can find out that all the qualities I think I know about somebody, all the properties I think I know about you, were false. What I will say if that happens is, oh, I was wrong about everything I thought I knew about you. I'm not going to say you're a different person. Right? It's, it doesn't matter that the qualities change. I'm still pointing. It's a rigid designator, he calls it. And you have that in whole soul, too, because you're pointing at the same intentional object no matter how the qualities change. And so, again, the first point is that there's, a, there's an infinite regress of relations, and so that's a problem with Latour's theories of relations. The second and third points were problems with the theory of actors, possible problems with the theories of actors. Maybe a thing is not the same as its relations. Maybe a thing is not the same as its qualities. And the fourth one is simply that uh, we find, uh, despite Bruno's wonderful career-long assault on Kant, which I cheer every step of the way, we still have not brought back the problems that Kant threw out of philosophy. All these cosmological problems that are eliminated forever, supposedly, in the transcendental dialectic, all the traditional metaphysical problems, are still not back. Uh, Whitehead picks up on a few of them. Bruno picks up on a few of them. 
Kant thinks it's impossible to know whether there's an infinite regress of holes and parts or not. Bruno tells us there's an infinite regress. You might read Bruno as just saying that for all practical purposes, you never know what the last black box is. But I think if you follow his logic, you have to say the black boxes never stop opening. And so in a way, he is asserting a metaphysical truth that there is no final atom that will be an unopenable box. And so I would uh, think we also need to be a little more ambitious about going right at the Cyclops eye of Kant and trying to save all of these problems that were canceled in the second half of the critique of pure reason. Uh, and we see a few people trying this now um, from various different angles. In Mea Su's book, we see him trying to tackle some of these canceled Kantian problems as well. He's coming from a totally different place from mine. So uh, what I've tried to do in this, in this opening summary is talk about what I consider to be the key concepts of the Tour's metaphysics, the key things that I appreciate about it, and also some reservations that I have, which come mostly from my Heidegger Husserl background. And I know s- some of his reactions to this because we've had a few of the email exchanges, but perhaps he would like to spell out some of his reactions to this for all of you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Peter and the Anthem uh, group. I try to be shorter than my time allotted so that we have t- time for uh, joinder at this time. I'm not going to answer the four questions which were, which were raised by uh, Graham because. Uh, because I don't have the answer to them. I, actually, I'm not sure I have a metaphysics. So uh, let, let me make two remarks about sort of uh, a user's manual of, that, of my argument uh, here. Uh, the, the difficulty uh, for me is that I've always, I mean, I'm not a professional philosophers, of course, and, and when I mean by empirical metaphysics, it's the word empirical, which is important for me more than the word metaphysical. In other words, I've been following, it, like, I like a dog following a prey, and then the prey arrives in the middle of a band of wolves, which are called professional philosophers. But I'm actually following the prey, and <laughs> I, my intention was not to get into these, uh, the, 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 the wolves and to answer all of these guys who are uh, trying to pick up my prayers and, and the dog also, of course. So, it, 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 I'm, not, I'm not being, di- I mean, I'm slightly disingenuous here because I'm also interested in leading the dog somewhere. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I, I, it's the exercise of doing metaphysics which uh, I'm uh, trying to, uh, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable uh, with in, in, in your book, which is a marvelous, I mean, for an author, it's marvelous to be compared with all these big guys. And even though I'm, uh, I, I don't have, I'm, I'm not delusionary enough to believe all what you said about what I've done, it, of course, is very uh, nice. Uh, but, but, but it doesn't mean that it's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I want here to be, uh, and very nicely at some point you say that my presence in the network of lecturers is actually peripheric. So I, I'm perfectly comfortable here in discussing. Uh, your book more than, than I mean your book discussing my book but your book as, as, I mean I'm, I'm just one of the author and one of the and not necessarily the best of course to in, in, in interpret your book and actually I'm not probably as Foucault said not the best <laughs> to talk about one's own work of course the, the author has no real uh, privilege but, but where there is a, a sort of distance with, with, with the work um, there are two things one of them is it's a, a voice-over for me, the, the, the book of metaphysics, the moment, the metaphysical moment when I write our voice-over to set, to talk about some empirical material which interests me most. Mm-hmm. And here we disagree in sort of style because you are not a sociologist or an anthropologist and you are more interested in um, the, the voice-over uh, itself. But for not just the reduction, it's half of the Pasteur thing. And it, it, for me, it's a binary weapon, and if you don't put the two chemicals together, it has no effect, in a way. And the same thing with Aramis, and the same thing with the Conseil d'Etat, and so on. And, and so, all of his work have a very, very different status, and I think that uh, the, philo- the big philosophers you mentioned are, are sort of homogeneously serious, so to speak. 
and I'm not homogeneously serious because it depends entirely on, on the task uh, at hand. So the second thing which makes, makes slightly different is that it, it needs also an experimental apparatus to be discussed, so to speak. So here today, the experimental apparatus which has been organized is a, is a comparison between Heidegger and I mean, myself, but I mean, I'm, I'm out of the loop here because I don't know enough about Heidegger, and, and certainly not as much as you, as, uh, as you do. But there are other experimental, and one, when I was privileged to be in this department here in information system, it was another experimental device where we try to see, does it make a difference if information is uh, modified, if the meaning of information is modified for doing empirical studies about lots of the things which is done in this uh, department. So I'm, I'm slightly uh, embarrassed uh, for a third reason, is that I disagree with most of what I've written myself. Uh, uh, so, uh, and I will explain that in, in, a, in a moment. So I agree with a lot of things you said about uh, irreduction, and I think you you made a marvelous and very witty <laughs> style uh, about getting out of a counter Copernican uh, revolution and being out of the human and non-human uh, things. And given the, the fact that we are still stuck, uh, even with my, many of my friends in sociology, with this human, non-human, I mean, here the philosophers prove that the philosophers uh, go much faster and, and, and further than uh, the social uh, sciences. And, and for that, I'm very... Uh, grateful. I, I think I also begin to like the word occasionalism mm. <laughs> and even vicarious occasionalism and uh, I like this idea that there's some of course completely unknown connection with the uh, Islam uh, uh, philosophy and, 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 and theology. Now where, where I have two sets of problems which um, the, the first one is I don't understand uh, the question you keep asking especially when uh, Basically, I prefer the first part of the book to the second part. I think it's, 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 uh, the more the book goes on, the more you impose, in my view, on a problem another problem, which I still don't get. And that, since the last chapter is not there, and your solution to your problem is not visible, it's difficult for me to, uh, to see. But what, the, the problem I don't, I don't see is after having said so much, which I think is right about the fact that translation is the core because of the irreducible singularity of every single object, you accuse me, or not accuse, but I mean, in your hyperbolic and very kind critique, says, uh, associate myself with everything is relation. And that I don't get. I, I simply don't get that. We have many exchanges, so uh, email exchange over the years, and in nice time in Egypt and so on. So, uh, we are not going to solve that, but I, 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 I don't understand the, the, the argument because for me it's precisely because of the irreducible singularity that is what you call something the inner kernel uh, of things that uh, they have to be translated without ever uh, emptying their, their, their qualities. So why am I associated with another school of philosophy which uh, would relate things to their relation? I don't understand. Actually, I don't understand what it means to say that the things is just its relation. And I have never really understood that. So, uh, and I don't understand why it is a problem in your book, since you, you do such a beautiful uh, job at showing that from the very beginning the principle of a reduction is precisely to say that uh, uh, it always at a cost that you, yeah, that you make a relation uh, possible. And actually it's something which you see in geography as well. I mean, I'm very influenced by Nigel uh, and, and the geographer more generally, which is a fabulous metaphor. It's because the reducibility, uh, reducibility of space, but you have actually to get into connection. That translation is, is made visible for the social sciences and that the tasks of mediation is, is visible. So on, on, it seems to me, but maybe I'm, I'm, I'm wrong here, that you, you, in the first part of the book, you see the problem very well and you, you, you show it, and then you, 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 you sort of shoehorn it in, into a problem which is a point precisely uh, as an alternative between uh, a thing would be made of its relation and, and a thing which would be made of its inner, which keeps its own sort of intimacy. And I, I, I still have a trouble because uh, it, it seems to me that it's precisely because of the reducibility principle that uh, things translation is so important. But it, again, it, I might not... Uh, the second problem I have before I get into the second part is that it's very difficult for me to introduce the word empirical as insignificant or disposable details. And here there is a strong disagreement, which is the heart of, uh, um, I mean, 
the difference between maybe a philosopher and social uh, sciences. Uh, if I take, for instance, the, the, the difference between uh, what you say, at some point, pragmatism is, 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 is okay in terms of methods, but it's not a good metaphysics, it means that metaphysics should be able to define the furniture of the world in a sort of coherent uh, way. And uh, if you have to be an occasionalism, which you now give me this beautiful term and I hold it, um, you have to be occasionalist all the way. That is, <laughs> empiricism is not about small detail which could be added up by another profession. Empiricism means that the detail of the actual occasions are the theoretical uh, important uh, feature that we, have, we want to detect. So, uh, if, if I take this example, which takes a lot of <laughs> a good part of your book, which is this micro, infamous example of pastors and the micro, if you get the general solution about backward causation, just a silly argument, and in terms of metaphysics, I will not defend it. Actually, I'm very worried that people, my colleague in the philosophy department here in this school, see that there is even my name associated with metaphysics, because I think they will be very, very cross. But <laughs> the LSE indulge into that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, because if you take it as a, a metaphysical argument, it, it, it's completely ridiculous. Now, if you follow it in the detail of fact that Pasteur does modify in his way he writes the, the whole history of fermentation from the Egyptian to uh, uh, the invention of wine, etc. Very explicitly, by actually writing papers showing that what people had believed before is now explained in terms of microbe ferment, of fermentation of a ferment that I, Pasteur, demonstrate. Then it becomes an interesting point. Because then you see that in this specific uh, instance, how uh, Pasteur does uh, solve the question of backward uh, causation. But I agree that, taken as a general principle, it's, it's, it's very weak. But it's a weakness which is due to the fact that it's a voice over for a phenomenon which itself is an important phenomenon, not the voice over. This is where I have sometimes uh, difficulty. I don't think one, I mean, the whole thing about the modernist, uh, the modernist, the all of that was really due because no one understood what we were doing in science. So it's, you see, it's not the same thing as to say what, I, what is the furniture of the world, which is a metaphysical question. And the other question would be to say, how come that after having described, I don't know, uh, let's take armies, a technical project, which no, no one is interested in technical project usually. Um, it raised a lot of interesting questions no one understands because precisely the continuation in time of a technical project is a big part which is not solved by any alluding to materiality in any sense, because materiality is precisely what is lacking so much in technical product as everyone in the information system knows. Okay, so here it's a case where the continuation of existence of a project is a complete enigma. No one understands because they said social construction of technology is adding a bit of society to a bit of technology, materialism plus social, I mean, the, the worst combination. Okay, then you have, because you want to understand this very strange entity, this very strange ontology, which is a project and not an object. Uh, but why do people don't understand? And that's, then you go, you realize that the metaphysics you have learned at school is still influential, influential into the mind of your reader, especially because they have all read Heidegger. And the present at hand is what you believe. So it's a very different type of production of metaphysical question when you you, you follow the prey, so to speak, once again, and, and not because you want to uh, establish the basic furniture of, of, a, of a universe, which I have to say, I hear completely an old-fashioned positivist uh, in the worst. <laughs> I think I'm like, I'm like Auguste Comte in that respect, I'm sorry to say, in the 19th <laughs> century. But if you want me to say, what is the metaphysics where pro technical project religious speech, political enunciations, uh, etc., uh, cohabit, then I'm happy to be a, meta a, a metaphysics, a metaphysician. But it's not exactly the same. Uh, the same uh, it's the same with the word pragmatism. I resent pragmatism as being only, uh, I, know, I know you don't think you is a great philosopher, but I, I think he's a very uh, interesting philosopher precisely of, because of the pragmata and the thing of which we, uh, you, you talk uh, at the end. So if you are a pragmatist, it doesn't mean it's just 
Well, there are small, a few small details that the social sciences will solve and, and the, like the basic uh, principle and foundation are done by philosophers. I, I, I resent that because I think it's wrong and that's not the way to do uh, to, collaboration, to collaborate between uh, philosophy and, and social sciences. Philosophy is too important to be the foundation of the social sciences. Philosophy is the, is, 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 is the, the calisthenic necessary to be as subtle as the case at hand, but it's not exactly the same uh, connection. So pragmatism means that we are pragmata. And I, I agree, actually, it's quite funny because Dewey is a terrible writer and, 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 and there is very little <laughs> pragmata in pragmatism in, in some sort of sense, in terms of inquiry. And yet I think it's quite on. Is that uh, <coughs> pragmatism is about pragmata and you, you need to be able to, to elicit the pragmata. So in a sense, I'm as, exactly as interested in methods in social sciences as I'm interested in metaphysics. And do I have a metaphysics? No. I don't think I have a metaphysics. That's fine. Uh, and the question of experimental metaphysics, which is the word I introduced in Politics of Nature, is a very important thing to, le- to leave experimental. Because if we begin to have to agree on what is the furniture of the world, are the object held up by an inner kernel of, uh, or, or connected? Do we touch the object or not? Then politics is certainly finished. Because there's absolutely no way we will settle this question. The second uh, set of dispute not dispute, but of course, uh, I am much more critical of, of myself than you are. Uh, immensely more, because I don't take the reduction. I mean, I take the reduction as a flow, completely flawed philosophy. Because, uh, I mean, actually, because of the point you mentioned very well, which is the virtuality uh, question. So, here, the virtuality, the question of potentiality. Uh, so, <coughs> This is slightly embarrassing, but in fact, four, three years after I've, read, uh, I've, I've written, published the Reduction, I embarked in another project which is completely parallel and absolutely antithetic to it, uh, which is a question of, of precisely, uh, which is an in mind in the physics in that sense, uh, which is the study of modes of existence or regimes of enunciation. So, if I had to do, uh, if I had to do a book. Uh, no, it's this is silly. If I could do a book of my, myself, I would be much more critical because I think the difficulty, I mean, actually, in one of the questions, uh, uh, the translator of Tart, my sister Toscano, makes a very nice point, I think, on that. Um, the holy reduction suppose a matrix. Actualism is the word we use, actually. Suppose a unified matrix of force. So it has, as you very nicely show, um, it has the nice effect of first solving the question of human and non-human, and then it has the nice uh, political, but it's still a political point of making the difference between potential and force. So to potential, to force, we will add nothing. And uh, I still think it's, it, it, it's useful because of the mind right divided and the whole uh, politics of epistemology which has been studied now. But that's basically done. Okay? So it, it's done at a price. And the price is that the, uh, the proliferation and the, the deployment of networks are un- uniformly grey. So I will be much less favourable than you are um, in the terms of, the, uh, in, of, the, of this, of, of this uh, philosophy. I think it's a useful uh, first step. But I think it runs in all the difficulties you mentioned, and maybe this is why... Uh, it doesn't foot the bill for all the things you said at the end, which is, the, do, is it an infinite regress, etc. I think it has much, much more difficulty than that. But the main difficulty is that it's a sort of generalized Nietzscheism, uh, which uh, has the, I mean, the, witness, the same weakness as, uh, as Nietzscheism, but is it's without defense against bas- uh, uh, basculé, uh, drifting into either vitalism in one hand or uh, a generalized uh, power struggle on the other and it, it, it's, it's defenseless against this accusation. So this is why from the beginning, um, 20 years ago now, I, I, I tried to do something else entirely, which is more, much more, uh, which, which is much more, se- for me, the serious philosophical work, which do connect with all of the guys you mentioned, still not very much high to my sorrow, but a lot with Whitehead, of course, and uh, you and all the, the big guys which is to add to the notion of network the key in which we are sent, so to speak. So the type of connectors. 
And uh, in other words, what, what you feel very, very well, which is obvious uh, in, in, in the reduction, which is a big weakness of activism, uh, and that network never managed to capture, is this notion of trajectory. So how many trajectory do we have? Can we trace the trajectory through uh, the different media? That's what I'm really uh, in, in, interested uh, in. So basically, can we shift from a theory of network to a theory of modes of existence? And then we can, I think, uh, tackle one of the questions which is very interesting in your book, which is, I mean, in your book, and about your own philosophy, not, not about my philosophy necessarily, and I don't have necessarily want to have a philosophy anyway, but what, uh, which is this question of the in, uh, continuation in time of the inanimate. Uh, because I think there is a large literature now uh, which tackle again this big question um, that you mentioned at the end about cosmology, uh, which are very, really uh, interesting. Where, where the question of continuation, in, in other words, if the big of question of operationism is how come that it, it subsists. Once substance has been put out, subsistence came into the fore, and then how many ways there are for an entity to graze their subsistence out of a green pasture, so to speak, is the big question. And this is a metaphysical question, unabashedly so, and I'm perfectly happy with that. But it's a very, very different question than the one which is... Uh, a general theory of the way objects relate to one another. I don't think there is any, because it's too different from when you are uh, a rock or when you are uh, uh, a being from uh, fiction or when you are uh, a scientific uh, reference and so on. And the differences here are much too strong. So that uh, a sort of general features of what would be entering into relation, no matter what you are, seems to me too much. I mean, I mean you can't say things about that, but it would be precisely the limit of the uh, uh, irreduction, which, 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 which was good for political reason, but as you say somewhere, something very nicely, a philosophy that is only good because it's a, it's a critique of another one is not, very, is not really good. And in that sense, I think irreduction was, uh, in, in some sense, so, sort of sense, uh, a, a critique. So, the, so we agree, of course, on, on many things, but that, I'm, I, in a way, I'm sort of more interested in Graham's philosophy than in my philosophy. <laughs> Uh, and, and Graham philosophy has this uh, very uh, energetic uh, ways of pointing at to the singularity and the materiality of uh, beings. Then it has this very uh, obses obsessive uh, quest for an inner uh, kernel which is different from its relation. And here I don't understand the point because I think we share the same, exactly the same argument, except I mean, even, I mean, I'd say even more than me, because the whole translation is necessary precisely because of the reducibility of the singularity. And then we have two completely different ways of practicing our philosophical uh, duties. One of them uh, is yours to, with much more seriousness than I can do, of course, to know the classics and see how they fit together. But with the difficulty for me that then you sort of send the task of solving the details to the other profession. And I'm interested in both. So I'm interested in binary weapon. In the book on the Conseil d'État, I'm exactly as interested in noting every little ways in which people speak or sit at the table and understanding what law is in its essence, in the most <laughs> Socratic <laughs> definition. So, because I think that if there is a philosophical uh, style, uh, which I can call mine, which I doubt very much, but that would be what I'm, I'm really uh, uh, after. Why? Because if substance is out as a way to explain subsistence, then how many ways there are to subsist is what I'm interested in. And here there is one line, I'll finish on that because I want to keep time for discussion. Uh, on one thing you don't use at all, which I, maybe it's my tard uh, influence, is that uh, it's Darwin. I'm, I'm a Darwinian. I'm a much more... I mean, here I can say that with great pride because being a Darwinian in the yeah, this is a great advantage. Not, not in the sense of Mrs. Uh, what's her name? Uh, the man of the Darwinian. Um, uh, uh, what's her name? She's a bit... 
But Darwin understands that the secularization of the singularity, uh, there is one of the questions actually in the symposium which is about that the type and token. I mean, I, I, like Tard, I still think it's this, this has not been registered in philosophy. Darwin is still, in, the social Darwinism has been registered even before Darwin died. But uh, and the, the task of registering the the full, in, the full secularization of differences <laughs> without immediately, as you say very nicely, transforming into uh, becoming uh, sort of an uh, entity is still fresh. So to speak. Darwin is still fresh. And in some very bizarre sense, I'd like to be a, a, a Darwinian uh, uh, philosopher where, where the, the tumult and the multiplicity of, of entities is actually uh, uh, set uh, free. Now, I have to do, is this the time when we answer the questions? I, mean, I think, no. Graham would respond and then we'll go to the questions. Right. <coughs> I'll pick out a few things from this. J- just one last thing. Okay. Cosmologically, I, I entirely share your view about the fact that why is it that big question has been abandoned? I don't believe it will be solved by philosophy, but I believe they have to be tackled by politics. So I wouldn't say the big question are cosmo- cosmological questions, but they are cosmopolitical questions. And the, que- the cosmopolitical question for me is the heart of what I'm doing, actually. I'm more political philosopher in a way than a metaphysician, even though I'm terrible in political philosophy, but that's another matter. I don't know, my notes are in very good order, so I'll pick them out as they occur to me. First of all, you certainly do have a metaphysics. That second half of your adoptions is about as compact a metaphysical treatise as I've ever seen. And that, by the way, that does not imply that I'm saying that's the metaphysics and then you're just applying it to specific empirical cases. I would never be so arrogant as to say this is the role of metaphysics. In fact, I would make a tardy in points of the kind that you made last night, which is that there's no real difference in size between metaphysics and the applied disciplines. But I'm just linking things together in a different way. And so, in a way, it's not fair to suggest that I'm trying to abstract some meta level that is not contaminated by the things. That's just, that's, those are the sort of actors I work with. And I don't think they're incompatible with politics, by the way. I don't see why you say that, because I'm not claiming that I have the final answer here and there's no room for the discussion. I'm so much of a Heideggerian to say that. Right? There's still going to be things, uh, aspects of the things that I'm not able to grasp and that conversation is needed to help negotiate. So I don't think those are necessarily in conflict. Um, I don't think metaphysics necessarily renders politics in your sense impossible. On the contrary. Um, at the same time, I'm not sure that you are simply following the cases and trying to get your metaphysics out of the cases, because pretty clearly, the idea that things can't be reduced was one of your guiding principles in very early, and this obviously affects how you read Pasteur and read the other, the other cases. And that's... It, that's not really a principle that was drawn from empirical observation, right? It was maybe a principle that was drawn from disgust and fatigue with all the attempts to reduce. And the, <laughs> the idea that maybe they're not, they're not fruitful anymore. <clears throat> but I think that is a princi- one of the principles that governs the way you look at cases, as is the idea that alliances are more important than hidden individual essences and potentials, and, and some others. Um, I'm glad you like the part about occasionalism. Very glad. And you didn't say anything about Bergson, but the last I checked with you, you agreed with me about that too. There's a difference between the two of you, okay? Because I think this tendency to, to mix the Tor Whitehead and Bergson Deleuze is very harmful. It's, it's, it's far too sloppy. So I'm glad that he's on board with, with that claim. As for Darwin, I simply didn't mention him because I wasn't trying to talk about all your historical influences. This, this is when I was working on that other book, that School X, School X book, where I was trying to talk about all your other rivals and allies and colleagues. And you were emphasizing that Darwin ought to be a part of that project. And that simply, this, this project spun off of that one because it was probably too long. That whole thing was going to be 900 pages or something and nobody was going to publish it. So this, this is a spin-off. Eventually I hope to go back and finish that other one that has you know, Bergson and Whitehead and some of these other people in it. And there will be some Darwin in there at your request. <laughs> we might have to have another conversation about that so that I get it completely. But I, I see what you're on to there. Um, I'm not sure that I get your new book yet. I, I, I understand that you see that as an alternative system to reductions. And incidentally, I, I've, I made this joke in San Francisco this summer that Bruno Latour is the only philosopher in history to have his early and late phases simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> He's been publishing the early Latour all along but while working on the late Latour. And it's like a manuscript, the laws of existence, that we had the privilege to read this summer in San Francisco, and which I hope will be out soon. We're going to work on it some more. Yeah, okay. Uh, where there are actually different types, 14 different, right? 
Yeah. What's in different modes in which the things can link with each other? Um, no, that's metaphysics, I agree. I think that book is metaphysics, I just don't get it yet. I, I, it's fascinating, but I don't quite get it yet. And you also say the 14 are determined empirically. They're not based on a well, philosophical I'm structure of... Empirically, yeah. <laughs> sort of. Four groups of three with two unifying them, which is how I was trying to read them. No, you want to say the 14 modes are drawn empirically from the history of Europe. Okay, so I'll, I'll wait until that book is out before I write a sequel to this commentary on the Tours next book. Um, can you explain, can you answer a question about, because I still don't understand, but I would be an, which would like the people to share our misunderstanding about this opposition between, but I would I be the, the interested in only object and their relations to the detriment of the singularity of the object? No, I think yeah. objects and relations are what you should be working on. It's just a question of how you define, ob- how you define objects and how you define relations. The, the only problem with relations was this, this question of infinite regress. You need a medium where things are directly in contact. Uh, otherwise, things are going to be separate forever, unless you bring in God or the human mind to solve it, which we can't. So there has to be a, there has to be a place where direct contact does happen. Um, otherwise, you just get mediators in between mediators in between mediators, and you never you never get where the contact happens. As far as the the, the real problem we've always had is, is this Heideggerian theme I always bring in about a thing not having anything to do with its relations. Right, this is actually the most important thing you said just now. You're saying that the fact that you think things need to be translated already covers you on that front, and that the thing is already inexhaustible. Uh, no, you said it very nicely. Okay, I learned it. I didn't, I didn't know. I believe I, I didn't know it before you said it. And I forgot. I said, that I said, oh, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> and I forgot that I said it until you mentioned it. Just now. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to keep learning from each other until old age. Uh, yeah, that is true. You are you are someone who makes translation so necessary that things are inexhaustible, but what does that inexhaustibility consist in? What is in the thing other than their relations to other things? It's kind of like Whitehead's, right? That for Whitehead also, the prehension is always going to be an oversimplification, but what the actual entity really is, is its past moments of prehension to all other things, right? There's no inner reality of an of a actual entity for Whitehead that is apart from any of its prehensions. It's constituted by those prehensions, and then it's just kind of to move on into the next set of prehensions it has to oversimplify the other entities in their past states. And so, yes, you're never going to exhaust the thing when you translate it, but what is that thing that's being translated? It starts off as just relational. It starts off as constituted only by its relations to other things. You say this yourself, that the part that I'm playing with in that mock Socratic dialogue, where you say that an entity is only its perturbations, transformations, and modifications of other entities, this is what I'm talking about. I would say that the thing is not just its perturbations, transformations, and modifications of other entities. It's something beyond that. Oh, something over and above. One of your unfavorite phrases. It's something more. It's something over and above and beyond those relations and, trans- and perturbations. And yeah, this is the this is the Heideggerian element in my work that we have never agreed about. We've argued it for many years. I'm happy to open it up for questions unless you wanted to respond. No, I wanted to answer, but I don't know when uh, to the question which okay. have been sent. Yeah. If, if you're both happy, we can then open to questions. It sounds like you want to respond, Bruno, to a couple of particular ones and then open up. No, I don't know when, it, when this is. I, I think there's a moment in the agenda where we discuss what has been sent on the mail. I don't know. Yeah, that's what we're moving on. Yes, uh, some of the participants have sent um, submitted questions which we were considering for the panel discussion oh, okay. later, later on. But um, if some of those issues come up now as part of uh, the natural discussion, that's fine. Okay. Open to comments, questions? J- just one point about yeah. this, because we are discussing here about another book which has not been distributed as generously as yours is that in this new book of mine about modes of existence, irreduction is one of the modes of existence. So it's one way of approaching the question, but with, with, which is very important because precisely it does not have the uh, might and right divide, but it has the limit of being one mode of existence, which is the deployment of actor network, so to speak. And uh, so this is to explain the... <laughs> it's not it's a bit unfair, but this question was... Maybe I'll actually address Alexi's question here because it deals directly with something I forgot to answer from what Bruno just said about pragmatism as a method versus philosophy as furniture of the universe. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, I do think metaphysics gives the furniture of the universe, but it doesn't mean I think that it can do it absolutely and in a final form. I was actually surprised to hear you say that you didn't mean the thing about the microbes literally in a metaphysical sense. You just meant it as a kind of probe or as a kind of because it certainly seems like you made it seriously when you say that microbes did not exist before Pasteur discovered them. The other, the other thing you said that's controversial in a different place, 
which is that you can't say Ramses the second died of tuberculosis. That's an anachronism because there was no tuberculosis discovered. Another thing that got me in trouble with this yeah. guy. On the other <laughs> side. Yeah. Wait, so I'm, I'm to understand now that you don't actually mean that literally, that you mean it. No, no, I mean literally, but the, 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 the proof of a case has to be in the case, ad hoc, the actual occasion. They cannot be, they can't be made uh, a general uh, statement because then it becomes in, in uninteresting or too uh, uh, flippant. <coughs> All right, I'm not sure I get that, but, but let me respond to Lexi's question, which is, is it possible that there could be both methodological and metaphysical readings of this controversy? And I just have a, a slight idea about this that I came up with yesterday, which is that maybe methods are better if they're wrong. Um, a method should be an exaggeration, essentially. Uh, it's more po- methods are more powerful if they're metaphysically wrong, in some sense. I, I thought of a few examples yesterday. One of them might be saying everything's merely its relations. Why? Because that can get you to focus on the relations between things. And that does a lot of work for you. Instead of getting lost in all these speculations about what the inherent essence of a thing is, it can be useful to say, let's assume that the thing is only its relations. I thought of other examples of this. One of, the, one of them would be realpolitik. I don't, act, what? Real politique. Oh. I, would, I don't actually believe that everything nations do is governed by a national cold calculation of national interests, but I do occasionally find it very refreshing to read Kissinger, or what, what's, what's his mentor's name, the guy that wrote the relation between nations, um, uh, whoever that guy is. It's very refreshing to read world geopolitics as if all that's governing the decisions are cold calculation of national interests. It, it allows you to get rid of a lot of hypocrisies and moralisms that might otherwise cloud your vision. I don't think that's the full picture, but I think it, it, is, it is a nice cold shower sometimes. It's like a very extreme method. The hyperbolic method I use is another example of an extreme false method. If you, you can actually do more justice to an author if instead of trying to find mistakes, you exaggerate it to the point where they've achieved total victory, you can see all their points, and then say, where are we now? Has this solved all of our problems for us? Uh, as opposed to the usual method of academic critique, which is to just go around and poke holes and find 28 mistakes in this author and 31 mistakes in this author, doesn't really get us anywhere. Um, so that's my idea about methods. That maybe method should be false. Maybe that's what it, that's when it's best. I raise the question because it's something that every time you read large horse books, it's kind of this is something that people start arguing about. The microbes has to be somewhere before Pasteur made them exist. And Whereas for me it has been kind of sort of methodologically quite nice insight that there was nothing to draw these things to before together before there was Pasteur who made them exist and I I haven't been obviously thinking about it it as a metaphysical question and so it has been just kind of a nice methodological insight to kind of look at the world so maybe you are right that it, they don't have to be metaphysically. Uh, wrong, or oh, sorry, right to be useful in empirical research because I'm kind of first and foremost I'm just a PhD student, so I'm interested in kind of understanding what what's happening here in the empirical world. But this is an important point because I, I, in spite of what Graham says, I'm not sure I don't want to agree with him too too, too fast with that because metaphysics then, in that sense, for me, for non pragmatism, for if, if metaphysics is interesting, it, it is as a method. It is as a, as a travel, as a way of getting at, at new uh, insights. It, 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 so the opposition between pragmat I, I actually had noted the same sentence as you did uh, with the question mark in, in uh, Graham manuscript because the opposition between pragmatism that works as a method and that as a metaphysics seems to me uh, in, in a way wrong because what is so interesting in pragmatism it is because it, it allows you to go to places and, and it's a trajectory, it, it, it's a way of doing things. So a lot of the of thing which I call philosophical are actually how to get there. Uh, why is it so difficult? I mean the principle of symmetry, which I've been a bit, don't use it so much now, but uh, which, is an, in, which appears in another question, was very useful for that. I mean you, you are dealing with scientific science and technology and people are just stuck. Is it a philosophical point? Yes. But I would not put so much weight on the philosophy part saying human and non-human are associated together. But as a, as, as a, as a, as a trajectory de- getting at data, it has been extremely fecund. And that, it's not an opposition between doing philosophy and doing social sciences, it's an opposition bet- between doing bad science and good science. I mean, that's the only thing which is really interesting. And if, if, if it's metaphysics that goes there, then let's do metaphysics. If it's reading Heidegger which goes there, let's read Heidegger. If it's reading Garfinkel, let's read Garfinkel. The question is to go there. 
and, and uh, metaphysics has all of these different paths that goes to the uh, to the heart of the uh, where where the substance and the meat uh, really is. And in, in the case of a, to a topic which is um, backward causation, the meat is as long as the difference between discovery and invention is not solved, you always go back to the classical distinction between uh, the history of science on one hand and the rest of history on the other. There's absolutely no way to get out of it. <coughs> then someone has to go there and tackle in uh, as much detail as possible the question of extracting uh, the backward causation from a specific case. Then after that, of course, we can say, well, it has been shown in one case, so it's probably true in the other one, and then there is one the generalization. But uh, that's, for me, pragmatism and metaphysics is, should be really connected very, very, very closely. Pragmatism is an interesting example of my points because uh, if you think what's the basic tenets of pragmatism method? It would be that if a, if a conflict makes no practical difference, then it's not a real conflict, it's not a real actual conflict. The problem with that is you don't always know what's going to make a difference when you have an intellectual conflict. Um, in one of the case I was talking about with the mediators coming in between any two terms, a pragmatist could just say, yeah, well, it makes no difference how Julio links to the neutrons. Who cares how he sees it, how he measures it? Of course, you could also open that up and do a study of that, too. But the, the pragmatist would just say it doesn't really matter where the ultimate point of connection is between things. You can just keep on opening the black box, black box as long as you want. You don't need to know the exact place where things communicate. But that in itself becomes a kind of metaphysics. It becomes a kind of human-centered metaphysics where you say that all that matters is practical effects. And so it's not as neutral towards metaphysics as it claims to be. Um, if you, you either think that there's a reality outside of human experience or you, or you don't, and if you do think that, then pragmatism can't be the method. You have to be able to talk about things that don't make a practical difference. But pragmatism is not about practice. Practice, practice. pragmatism is a pragmata about object, and the question is, and, and is an experimental, it's an experimentally based philosophy. And in that sense, I, I think here you are not using your uh, usual generosity on pragmatism, uh, because it's precisely an experimental, the, the notion of experimental is very important. So, if, is there, in that case, is there an, uh, a protocol for an experimentation in which Jolio eyeball counts or not? Is the question which we pragmatists should tackle? I agree, but uh, it's not a question which is just about, uh, uh, I mean, send to the question of, of practices. I think that's unfair to pragmatism. All right, maybe about pragmatism, but it depends on how you define the pragmatism. If you define pragmatism only in terms of their relations with other things then that's also a metaphysical presupposition, whereas I'm trying to say that the things are, are beyond that, those relations. And I don't think you need a protocol to, to say it's, what... It's, it's because things are beyond relation that they have relations. That's true, yeah. So this is why I never understand the opposition between having relation and being beyond relation, because uh, I mean, every geographer will tell you that. If there is, a, uh, if there is a, a road between two cities, because these two cities are not the same city, so if the two cities were the same city, there would not be any road between them. It's because they are irreducibly two cities that you need a road between them. That's, that's right. But then the question is, what were the cities? What are the cities themselves without the roads? Are you going to define them in terms of other relations to other things? Or are you going to it, define them? It will certainly add. I mean, all the geographers have worked with them endlessly. The whole question. I mean, Nigel has written a whole book about this question of cities. Oh, yeah, this I mean, <laughs> no, actually, you must have written three books. <laughs> Um, my God goes by salvos, of course. But <laughs> the, the, of course, the fact of having a road with the men have modified them. But it, the, the, the whole opposition between having relations and being beyond relations escaped me even now. I don't. I simply don't understand because it's precisely if you if you if you mean this 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 silly argument. And here I agree entirely with you. But if you make the sum of, of qualia mm -hmm. uh, and then you have the substance, mm -hmm. I mean, but who has actually ever said that? Most of, the, most of the British empiricists have said that the substance yes. is simply an arbitrary bundling of, of qualities. Yes, but the beyond is always there. I mean, that's, I mean, even in Hume, actually. But that's another question, because the whole, the whole question of Hume is, is with the mind and habits and, and, and so on. And anyway, the Brits, okay, let, let the Brits do their own thing. <laughs> <laughs> but in the continental or European... <laughs> it's... Pres the, the very strength of, I mean, and it's funny because it's really something which is very powerful in your book. It, it's precisely uh, the, the very, uh, very powerful point that it's because things are reducible that 
the relations are now center stage and that they are costly. And that every single one, and whatever they do in terms of religion, they cannot escape and empty the uh, powerful uh, singularity. Eh? So you, 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 you make the point and then you seem to use it as an opposition, and but, uh, but still I don't understand. But I'm sure we'll come back to this later. Maybe this is that triggering any responses, further questions, clarifications? Anybody wants to contribute? So one brief point that you could maybe say a bit more about, I would be interested uh, in the relation this is about agnosticism. Because I think about the discussion about pragmatism, the fact that Graham, that you uh, find it very uninteresting uh, to detect an object by its effects. No, no, not interesting, just wrong. I think it's very interesting. Well, yeah, or wrong. <laughs> I think a, a crucial element there is the, the agnosticism that is built into the pragmatist method. So because pragmatists are not um, contemplative uh, metaphysicians, um, because they say we, we will not decide in advance what the world is made up of, this is why they go with this weak signal of the effect. Because that is the only way to get to a new object, an object that is not yet uh, mapped, known, defined. And that seems to be one of the think, important differences, maybe, that plays in this discussion as well. Except that Heidegger is also an ultimate agnostic. Isn't he? I mean, you're never going to know everything. Everything's only going to be partially unveiled. So I think there's agnosticism there too. But that's simply because he doesn't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, what do you mean? Um, not sure, but James. I mean, in James, it, it's a very, very, very beautiful way. James has a very nice way uh, of answering, in, in spite of the fact that James is responsible for having used these metaphors, which make them the philosophers say it's just practice, that it's just a practical uh, effect. He also has the vocabulary, which is the non-skeptic version of occasionalism. In, 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 in your book, you mentioned a point which I think is really... Uh, there, there are two uh, absolutely uh, brilliant uh, points, which I hope you will develop in the last chapter. I mean, I'm talking about Graham's philosophy there. One is that we are bold when we hit one another, have a very uh, impoverished version of one another. And I, I think... Uh, I mean, you repeated that uh, this morning, which is quite nice, that uh, it doesn't take the human mind to have an impoverished version of the world. Every entity does that to the others as well. So uh, that's a great uh, moment. The other one is that, and it's connected to the agnosticism question, is that uh, empiric- uh, uh, skepticism is an occasionalism. And what I sense in your, in your uh, objection to pragmatism is actually a skeptic argument, uh, a remnant of a skeptic uh, argument. If if there are only differences because there are effects, how do we know that it's not the, the way uh, Jolio um, cures here, which is really the important thing in making a connection? There, there's no way to choose that. Uh, Steve Woolgar always reminded me when we were doing laboratory life, why is the wastebasket not the most important thing to study in your laboratories? And why, why, do, you, and why do you dismiss the wastebasket as unimportant? I did dismiss the wastebasket as uninteresting. Uh, and I think I had good grounds for that. But again, I mean, in terms of skepticism, there is no way you could dismiss the wastebasket as being the most important feature. So, what, 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 the, what James, I think, uh, the, the, the James solution is in the, continui- the continuity of the connection which is established. Again, it's a question of trajectory. So he answers the skeptic and he answers the cash value uh, people, which is an inferior version of James, by this question of continuity of the trajectory of learning which for him is essential. And of course, he made the unfortunate move to say uh, this is as good as, as possible. I mean, uh, and of course, then all of the metaphysicians drum, jumped on him and saying, well, uh, you are not ambitious enough, you want just an inferior version. But actually, what he was trying to do is precisely to answer the skeptics. And it's the continuity of a trajectory of proof production, which is so interesting in James, which I took up and expanded a bit in this industrial definition of a true condition. One of the most interesting passages in any of your books. Uh, as for Jolio, I think you've misunderstood my point about that. I'm not trying to say the problem is that you can't tell which is the most important mediation. I'm trying to say that all the mediations have to be accounted for. 
because as, as long as you have different entities, as long as you have any two entities linking, there's always going to be a third meeting you know. So I'm not just saying there's no way to know whether it's Julio in politics that's important or Julio in the eardrum. I'm saying that it's, uh, any two entities at all have to be accounted for in their relation, and, and you can't keep inserting mediators in between some terms and passing the buck as to where the causation actually occurs. And so there has to be some third medium. And I, I didn't talk about that in this book. I'm going to talk about that in the final chapter. I have a different solution. Uh, that's not so important today, but let's just express it in negative terms today. I think you cannot keep on saying that there have to be a third term mediating any two others and not finally reach a point where the mediation stops and where there is a direct contact of some sort. And that's paradoxical because your whole philosophy, wonderfully so, is about requiring the mediators, but it can't go on forever. There has to be a point at which it happens. And, and what I worry about is that we, if we don't specify that metaphysically, then it becomes just kind of an ad hoc practical decision. Which is fine for history. You could say, all right, it seems like Julio politics and neutrons is an interesting one, but Julio and the eardrum is not that important, so we can we can stop there. And that's that's fine for purposes of writing history, but it's not fine for metaphysics. Why? Why? Because you haven't explained how contact can occur. But metaphysics is not to explain. I mean, it's the first principle of process and reality. Philosophy is not in the business of explaining anything. Actual <laughs> occasion to explain one another, not philosophy. If there's one thing which philosophy should not do to try to explain anything. That's where our disagreement is. Philosophy is not in the business of explaining. This is not, it's not at all the same thing. Philosophy is in this business of allowing the explanation to go far enough, to, to help the explainers to move in the explanatory trajectory, but not to provide an explanation. Of what explanation will, will you, you will add to the Marie Pasteur uh, infamous <laughs> statement about microbes? Doing more archives work on pastors? No, you, you, you have to account somehow for what the reality of the thing is before it's discovered by anything else, what the interaction is of the microbes with other things in the environment when humans didn't know about it yet. That's what you'd have to do in the metaphysics. To, to we disagree with that. I mean, I'm much more white than yeah. actual occasion. I have no other explanation than actual occasion, and philosophy is not in the business of explaining it. Because it, it's, a, it's in a different... The meta-language and the language are in a different uh, situation of that. I think that... That's what the, that's the problem with the student of the information system in my we are sending the social book is. He wants a meta language but provide an explanation and I disagree with that. I'm just trying to make sure that we're not getting too trapped in the word explanation here. Is this really a disagreement between us or not? This sounds suspiciously like the disagreement I had with Gerard Fries in Amsterdam a few weeks ago where he said the same thing. That philosophy is not about explaining. But the problem is I think you end up with a different kind of explanation. You end up by saying that what makes reality is the importance of the person who's trying to go further in the explanation. That's a metaphysical decision. That's not an innocent methodological step, right? You're, you're, what you're saying is that it doesn't really matter. There isn't really anything outside of the person who's trying to find the explanation. It's a human-centered philosophy. It's not realism enough for me. No, I'm not saying that either. I agree with what the objection uh, you make. I'm, I'm, I'm just here strict white in an actual occasion. That's one job. All right. But philosophy is not in the business of foundation of anything else. Maybe there is a slight... A founding? I'm not sure it's... Foundational. See, I don't think it's foundational, what I'm saying. Foundational to me would be if you claim to give it some sort of enduring foundation that you're going to build everything on. I'm too Heideggerian to say that. I think the foundation is always going to be elusive. I think you're not trying to get it a foundation, you're trying to get it a reality that's outside of the relations, and you're never going to know exactly what that reality is. It can't be a foundation. But uh, it has to be there because you can't account for the situation just with the relations. There has to be something doing the relating. Okay, we had a question there, second, third, fourth. Um, I also have the same question for you, Graham, so I can ask it again. But uh, the question today is, if you're trying to, it seems to me you're trying to explain a, a problem that you define as inexplicable. Because once you say that the thing is, has a kind of inner essence that can't, by definition, relate to something else. And the attempt to explain how it relates to something else is a, is a doomed quest. I mean, the, the, the issue is, could you not look at certain systems where, uh, you know, relation by definition relates things that are not, that are distinct, as, as um, Bruno Tour said. So doesn't the word relation solve your problem for you already? So that if, if you take, for example, a simple canonical example, like a chess game, you know, relations of chess require distinct separate pieces that have an individuation or an individuality. Mm -hmm. But that individuality is what it is in terms of relation to chess. I mean, it doesn't exist uh, abstract those relations. You don't have you know, a rook as a rook. You have 
piece of plastic, which could itself be understood in other kinds of relations. He gave the example of a building. Now, there, there are relations of real estate, architecture, urban planning, and so on, that require distinct individual buildings. For the example of yourself as having a self, you know, there are ideological systems that have an investment in you having an inner self. Abstract all those things out, what are you left with? You know, if you take a scenario, for example, of looking not for a, a building, but for a, a camping site or a dwelling where you could spend the night. And that means, you know, that's a set of relations that it puts you in a certain kind of landscape and makes you look for certain kinds of things. Where I can touch my tent, is there water, is there ground, is there flat, etc. The thing is, if you take away all those criteria, are you left with something like a campsite? Would it have an individuality that would be there? Would there be an inner essence to the campsite? And if not, given your definition of what an object is, you know, isn't that a problem? Okay, um, first I want to uh, talk about your first point, which is the relations in many ways all already solve the problem. Well, yes and no. Relations do occur. So in that sense, the problem is solved by reality, yeah. Things are not just in vacuum sealed bubbles that never touch. They do touch. And that's what has to be explained. Given that an object, by analysis, reveals that it should be something that withdraws some more relations, or at least by my analysis. So then you just have to figure out, this is paradox, because on the one hand, objects seem like they should be this, and yet relations and events do occur. And so what I'm trying to do is account for how that happens. And I don't think it helps to just start by saying it's a fait complete, we don't need to worry about it. That's like saying that, um, that's like answering Bergson's charge that movement can't be made out of cinematic frames by showing a movie and saying, look, the picture's moving. <laughs> well, yes, but that doesn't give an explanation of what movement is. Um, as far as the chess pieces, you asked this a year or two ago, and I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it as much as I should have, but it just popped into my mind. Saying that there is no rook in itself in a chess game is sort of like saying, there is no I and myself if you're looking at my family structure, right? It's like my relation with my brothers and my parents. Yes, of course, of course, if you look at that as a chess game, sort of a horrible metaphor for a family. If you look at that as a system of relations between these five people, uh, yes, and of course, qua family member, I make no sense in myself outside of that, but qua individual, I do. Now, with chess pieces, it's a little less interesting because a you know, rook in itself is not very interesting. It's a pretty impoverished, like it has certain physical structure. Some of them are quite pretty. Some of those chess sets. As far as the as far as the campsite, I'd say something similar. Yeah, there is a campsite in itself, and the way you can see this is by counterfactual examples. You can see, you can be at a campsite and say, "Wow, wouldn't such and such a person love this?" And you can kind of imagine in your mind how that person would react to this particular campsite. And it's it's what they're reacting to as you imagine that thought experiment is not your reaction to it and his reaction to it and the reaction of everyone else who's there now. You're imagining their reaction to the campsites which is something that is not going to be commensurable with anyone else's reaction to the campsites. By definition, none of, us have a, none of us have fully grasped what that campsite means. Other people can be imagined coming. Different animals can be imagined set loose in that campsite who might react to it in different ways. Uh, and so I, I don't have a problem with saying that there's a campsite in itself. Even if something is created only by relations, like a campsite, or like some, or a society, the land that talks about this in his new book, humans create society, and yet there is still a society in itself that we never fully grasp. So I don't, I don't see it as that difficult to think that there is a, an in itself for everything that's created. Okay. Things in itself are actually yes. things that you reach, which is always a paradox of... No, what is? It's always a thing that you reach, actually, things in, in themselves, which is very funny in Kant itself. So it's like tourism. You always want to be alone. You go into very far, far away <laughs> places, and then you resent having all of these other choices. <laughs> Is there, <laughs> but actually, things in, in itself is what you reach. So it's always a paradox of an epistemological version of a truth condition. Okay. I want to ask if uh, you have any questions Graham a little more about the word of metaphysics, because I think some of the some of the debate that's emerging is about what the meaning of that word might be. Um, and let me say what I think your position is, Graham, and then maybe you can tell us more about why you want that version. But as I understand it, um, you're looking for a metaphysics that is not a foundation, right? that is mobile, that's capable of designating uh, various ontological elements as being active or passive, having agency at one moment, not no agency at the next. However, you're uninterested in a metaphysics that is so flat or so so adherent to the punctuality of occasions 
so trapped within it, that all one can say about those occasions is that they happened here, 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 and here. Mm -hmm. In other words, you want to avoid a metaphysics whose practice would then be serial redescription of events in the mode of chronicle history. But you also want to avoid something like foundationalism. Mm -hmm. Does that seem like a fair representation of what, yep. kind of what you want to do with the word and maybe some of the problems you, you see with how the word might be missing? That's right. Uh, I, I agree with all of that. It was completely accurate. I, just, I would just add a few things to it. Um, right. I, I guess I still have this basically Heideggerian strand in my work, and I don't think it's really that easy to be a Heideggerian foundationist. Right? Because the foundation is always slipping away from you, and he doesn't even call himself the last philosopher, as every preceding great philosopher did. Uh, uh, and so, no, that's not, not a foundation. I really do not think that you're deriving empirical facts from this foundation at all. I think you're inspired by these empirical facts. I, I, I read mostly non-philosophical stuff. When I go into bookstores, I usually go away from the philosophy section. It's usually too boring. I find myself in any other subjects, um, history, science, precisely because I'm more inspired by these mere empirical details, which is not what I really think they are. Somehow, they, they, I, I can't quite account for why these have a greater philosophical influence on me than philosophy books do anymore, but they do. Uh, so I, uh, I do think the individual cases are important. And yes, I, right, they should not be trapped in punctual occasions. There's something outside those occasions that can't be grasped by them. I also maybe should clarify the, the difference between my use of the word metaphysics and the use of it by, say, Heidegger and Derrida, where it's negative. So this might not be easily familiar to everyone. Uh, Heidegger, uh, metaphysics for Heidegger and Derrida is bad because it's onto theology. It means that you're taking one particular being and use it, using it as the exemplar that explains the rest. And I think this is nicely attacked also by your reductions. Uh, what they're attacking is simply a form of reductionism. That there can be any one entity that explains all other entities. And so, no, I'm not, I'm not hoping to revive that kind of metaphysics. I think that is rightfully dead. Um, for me, metaphysics means something more like realism. That you're trying to say there is a reality that escapes any manifestations of that reality. You can never be sure quite what it is but you can offer some description of what the structures of that reality are. It's not totally hopeless, as Kant seems to think it is. Uh, I think that's what philosophy can do. It's philosophy is just an attempt to, metaphysics at least, is an attempt to dig down a few feet further into the ground than people think you can. It's not to find the bedrock. I don't think we find that. Can I ask a question to, to this gentleman? Yes. What's wrong with serial redescription? Because, in fact, serial redescription would be a pretty good definition of what I would call as if, of course, by serial and re-description, you add, of course, to the, what you could say, punctual, or uh, mm -hmm. uh, the key with which they graze their subsistence away. And in that sense, serial re-description seems to be a very good definition for the social sciences as well as for philosophy. It's okay. it, you, we accompany the task of the entities in their survival, so to speak, and their grazing uh, their subsistence in, in a very, very practical manner. Well, I think I asked it that way because I wanted to also think about what your practice might be. Mm -hmm. But so my next question would be, what's the difference between the addition to serial redescription, which your key adds, versus the depth of metaphysical reflection that Graham's system adds? What, what, what is the difference? Well, it's better to be a serial redescriptor than a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that too. <laughs> serial redescription is what he does. I think that's a good description. It's not a good description of what I do, so I think you know something important. It. I'm a serial redescriber. Now I yeah. know who I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, this, you also, in your question, touched on this. A bit too. Is there a practical difference between the two? Yeah. And uh, the answer I thought of yesterday on the train for this is one that he somewhat refuted last night in his very nice talk on Todd. I was going to say that uh, one thing that's always made me uncomfortable in Bruno's histories is he, he has a lack of sympathy, not just for the losers, because people have criticized him for, criticized him for this before, right? That you overvalue the winners and give short shrifts to the losers. I put that slightly differently for me. I don't mind that you give short shirts to the losers. I think there's a difference between deserving and undeserving losers. And I think it's the deserving losers that get lost in this philosophy. He, he has no sympathy for the 
the lonely, neglected genius. Right? This is a figure that doesn't really appear in his histories. You know, Pasteur fails at his, at his translations. It's as good as if he never existed. I wouldn't go that far. I, I think that uh, without subscribing to some naive idea of latent genius and the person before they do what they do, you, you can, it does, it's not senseless to look at a case and say, what a, what a tragedy, that person had a great idea and it just didn't catch on at the right time. Is that really a meaningless statement? Yes, in practical terms, it's as, it's as good as though it were a terrible idea. It doesn't make a difference. But I think there is a difference between good and bad losers. It might not always be easy to judge which is which, but uh, when we write counterfactual histories, this is what we do, isn't it? We try to find things that could have happened, hidden strengths that were not tapped, uh, possibilities that were there. We don't treat all those failed possibilities equally, do we? we? We know that some of them are more likely than others, more likely to succeed than others. Um, so I think maybe if you if you confine yourself to read a script, serial description, is there a possibility that you're too trapped in the level of what actually happens? Now, I don't know enough of the ANT literature to know how much has been done in a different direction, how many possible counterfactual cases have been done in literature, maybe a lot, but you, the, the reason I backed off on this a little last night is he did a nice job of time. You, you did, he didn't deserve to lose necessarily. He lost, but there are all these riches in his, in his sociology that you were trying to bring back last night in the lecture and at dinner. Uh, it did so very eloquently. So obviously you're aware of this. I just think that there's, there's uh, maybe a little more room for the, the failed genius than he leaves in his philosophy. But that would be philosophy of history. I'm not sure I have any idea about this. But, no. but the serial way description is a powerful way of uh, following for you know, an institution. Mm -hmm. What is an organization, actually, even in organization theory, even in the most classical sense in management, if not a serial redescription, which starts, and it's true, every morning. I didn't know that for sure, but now that I'm head of a school, I know that it's actually <laughs> yeah. literally true. And that the metaphor I had used of baboons Many years ago, it's exactly a good way to describe an organization as being a science po. Is that you, you reinvent the organization every morning? But it's exactly that it's the lack of subsistence of it. So, in the occasionalism and in the punctuality of existence, the organization is a very interesting animal to study because their, their, their way of grazing their subsistence is visible uh, and empirically studiable. In, in, in a dramatic uh, manner, which we might forget for these things or this sort of being there, but for a uh, moral person, as we say in French, a person moral, a corporate body, in, 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 for a corporate body is, is, is extremely visible. So, is not corporate body a good metaphor for metaphysics? I mean, a good case model for metaphysics? I, I, I think so. But one of the things which is always forgotten in the microbes cases is that there are billions of microbes. Mm -hmm. So their, 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 uh, what we mean by their pixelization is actually an immense problem. Uh, I have now a student who study uh, yeast uh, in a laboratory in the south of France. And, I mean, yeast is always going by the billions. There is a fridge. The whole laboratory turns out a fridge <laughs> where yeast are taken in and out. And, every, and, and they, 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 everyone struggles with, that's where metaphysics is useful, because these poor biologists are struggling with the impossible task of having completely artificial, completely natural swarm of yeast by the billions that they have to qualify in the crypto sense of the, of the, of the hard designer. And my metaphysics would be, to understand the yeast, you have to read crypto. But of course it's the yeast which is interesting. Thank you very much uh, for saying you'll re describe it. <laughs> it's marvelous term. Uh, because there is description in the middle and it's, it's a marvelous term. Lucas has also got his own baboons to look at. <coughs> yes, yes. Um, the, the, w one of the ways which uh, Bruno deals with this problem of explanation versus description uh, is to, to use the term explication. Uh, and ex explication is this unfolding, unfolding, uh, and in a way. Uh, so if, if explication is this unfolding, then the unfolding is its own explanation, uh, and and that's achieved through the serial description, the mm -hmm. description. Uh, but what I understand your criticism is is that. How do we know that the unfolding has been sufficient 
for the explication to have happened. In other words, what's the criteria for stopping? Uh, and in the Socratic dialogue to the student, uh, Bruno has an answer. He says, well, when you've done 50,000 words, right? He's going to accuse me of pragmatism. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and in a way, that's that's a yeah, very pragmatic answer. But but it seems to me that's problematic because um, coming back to your criticism, in a way, the very next unfolding, the very next serial uh, serial description mm-hmm. might invalidate or bring into question all the descriptions that have come before. And so, how do we know that the next or the choice we made? to describe A rather than B, to unfold A rather than B, uh, that that choice might have, in fact, been fatal in the description. Uh, how do we know? Uh, and since we don't have any criteria, we can't make that choice beyond saying, well, we've done 50,000 words, or, you know, time's up, project's finished, we can't go any further. And, and, and so I, w- I wondered whether you know, that's a way of thematizing this difference between your need for some explanation or rather explication that is sufficient at some level and your pragmatic answer to 50,000 words. Except that in this case I would, I would also give the same advice to the student. Sure. <laughs> so I think pragmatism works as a method even if it fails as a metaphysics. And, and I think with writing it's extremely important to say that okay, this book will be finished Right. I did that with, with this book. I said this book will be finished when it's August 25th, and I have to fly to Amsterdam ten hours later. And that's where I got lost in the last chapter. But everything else was structured according to that arbitrary deadline. How much can I fit into these few weeks? So there is a way to write. Sure. But that doesn't mean that that is. You see, this is somehow bearing on the difference between these two approaches. Why, why is why is that a sufficient criteria? So the question is. It might be that the, the choice you make in terms of describing A rather than B, or uh, or, or, prevent, or stopping your description at this particular point, that that stopping might have been just pro- just prior to the ex- the explication that would have given a, a more adequate explanation or adequate explication. Well, that's a failed experiment. Okay. That's where I'm 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 a pragmatist in the in the good sense of the word pragmatist in the Jewish sense, and now we talk about serious social sciences, which is that uh, there is no two two protocol, there is no criteria in the sense of there is no scientific method. And actually, Nancy Cartwright here in this school has written the most funny paper on scientific method ever by taking the average out of all the advices of all the books about scientific method and they are of an extreme banalities. <laughs> uh, something like uh, read the literature, uh, listen to colleagues, uh, don't listen too much to colleagues and uh, <laughs> go on without with care. I mean something which is completely absurd. So every criteria of where do you stop the research and where do you begin the research is of the same banality. But now, the, 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 the setup of the experimental situation in which you work yourself, on your own work, on your own uh, thesis, is a crucial question which is exactly as difficult, as uh, constraining as it is in the natural sciences, even more so, because in the natural sciences, a lot of things help you paradigmatically to focus on. So, the big problem of social sciences is to invent, and in that sense, the same for philosophy the experimental protocol which is adjusted to the specific recalcitrance of a beast you want to study. But the, but the, the fact that there is no general uh, principle doesn't mean that it's everything goes. On the contrary, it's because there is no criteria that the constraints of a, of a case are so important. But uh, here, it's they are pragmatic in the good sense, but it have to be, ad- ad- what do you want to study? How much money do you have? And what's the beast you want to follow? I mean, if it's studying uh, a tribe in, in New Guinea, it's not the same equipment as if you want to study an organization or a yogurt factory or an information system. So, this is on the, here I don't think there is any disagreement with that. This, 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 the, the social sciences are obsessed by epistemological question in a way that no science, no real science is. You never have a class of chemistry that starts by methodology of chemistry, you start by doing chemistry. And the point that since the social sciences don't know what it is to be scientific because they know nothing about the real sciences, 
they imagine that they have to be taken endless numbers of criteria and precautions before doing anything, and they usually miss precisely what is interesting in natural sciences, which is a laboratory situation and the experimental protocol. But this is what I try to explain to the, to the students in the, in the book. And, and in our field, it means writing. I mean, writing is our protocol, and writing is our laboratory, and it's as difficult to set up a good writing as it is to set up a good laboratory. I don't think that's what is at qu on, on, on question here, because uh, I'm more maybe as interested, and I, I have the privilege of seeing some of the students of, uh, of Agram in, uh, in Cairo, and probably here we don't disagree at all on how to direct. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, it, it, that's not a metaphysical opposition. It's just a way to get rid of epistemology. But it, it's mm -hmm. a disintoxication cure that has always to be taken again because epistemology creeps back always. Peter. Um, I'd like to uh, deploy this uh, experimental apparatus that uh, Professor Latour uh, alluded earlier, the, the Heidegger-Latour um, situation here. And one of the points that uh, Graham um, appears to be making is that for Heidegger there is this withdrawn realm that's uh, inaccessible and uh, which um, has been um, demonstrated through this uh, president at hand, um, uh, ready to hand uh, uh, sort of dualism that he has developed. Um, in uh, reassembling the social, um, on the other hand, quite, uh, the practically almost the whole book starts to point to this final chapter where we are promised to behold something through this new topology that, uh, that uh, you uh, develop. And there we encounter this um, image of the plasma, which uh, is said to um, not be inaccessible, but it's something that is unknown. But it's not hidden, but is unknown. Um, and uh, actually, I'd love to preempt uh, also Isabel's question to also uh, ask uh, a question about the plasma. So, but but uh, I, I would be curious to um, see what is the role of uh, plasma, or is that again, is that? Uh, a, a metaphysical discovery, perhaps, as, uh, of, of the reassembling the social experiment. Well, we'll talk again because I think there's another question on plasma, right? Yeah. But uh, this is an unseen uh, uh, point, and even though my knowledge of Heidegger is not as, as strong, of course, uh, Graham reminds us uh, that he was a student of Husserl. So Heidegger has to do a lot of work to keep his own turf out of great grasp of his natural sciences. These guys, Husserl is the same, are obsessed by the domination by the natural science. And one of the points that Graham, which is very nice in the book, is that we are not obsessed by that question. And we don't want to leave naturalism to the enemy, either. Uh, and when I say we, it's the meaning of the science studies, which is really my home. Uh, and that's a very big difference. So plasma is what appears once the, so the natural sciences are added to the pot, so to speak, and made to circulate, not to cover the whole. See, you have to realize that this guy in the 19th century, I mean, most, almost all the way until the ecological crisis really started to modify the situation in the 1980s, they had to survive to get just a little bit of space which was not invaded by the natural sciences, biology and economics and information systems. <laughs> they, they, had to, they had to have a little lot uh, where they could cultivate their, their little uh, uh, carrots and, 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 and uh, cabbages. If not, it would be taken out of it exactly like here. You have to still have to fight just to exist against uh, the Dawkins and all these other guys here of this world. I mean, Dawkins disappeared a bit. But. So, the, what people don't understand is that when you do science studies, you have completely different views. But the whole space is actually empty. And then in this very, very empty space where ignorance is the rule, basically, you have circulating a few veins, very, very, very few veins, which are the circulation of active and unformatted knowledge about mathematics and about chemistry and about physics and about sociology and about economics. So it's a reversal of, of background and foreground. Plasma is what you do when you make, when you obtain to your shock when you make all of the formatted knowledge circulate inside the landscape, and when you don't accept the situation which has been the situation of our 
But this is, uh, I'm not talking about the Middle Age, because someone asked a question about the Middle Age, of course, which is much more interesting than that. But the modernist predicament is largely that you left the primary condition to the enemy, so to speak. And then, of course, what you suffocate, and then you try to get a little bit of, of things, and we have to find it in, in preci precisely this very, very pious uh, Stein and of, 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 uh, of Heidegger. But we are in a completely la different landscape. Now, how do you call what is not formatted? That's my. I mean, the world, uh, you can abandon it and uh, do our, our, our pr pr proliferate. But that's, that's the difference, I think, with our predecessors. We, we are never in awe nor in dispute with the natural sciences. We lie to them because they occupy so little space. And when you're struck by the ecological crisis, immediately you realize a completely different territory. We know barely nothing. We are in complete ignorance. And then you have this very, very little canal or channel of knowledge in the middle of a completely empty space. So suddenly you breathe, a lot of space, then you are terrified by our common ignorance, <laughs> and then the question of reassembling the collective becomes central. That's the difference, I think, in terms of landscape with the, the Husserlian student. They, they had really survival in, in, in the book on Heidegger um, by Graham. You, 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 there's a very nice passage on, on Husserl's situation, and it, it, it was a survival. How can we survive the natural sciences? Now it's not a question, it's how can we allow, can we allow the natural science to survive? Literally, now. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole landscape is different now that the Earth has become the political uh, center stage. Uh, just, just to add to Peter, maybe what sort of Peter is uh, trying to get the hold of to the question is what, what what is this sort of unformatted knowledge? How are we supposed to sort of get a hold on it? <coughs> Consider it. Oh, it's extremely easy. You, this is what, this is the missing masses of all the formatted uh, version of what is a management, mm -hmm. what is an organization, what is an interchange, what is a religion, what is a, a science. Uh, you dip in it, I mean, if you do, my easiest way to do it to the students to do a description, a little description exercise. I did that when I was here. You do a one, uh, one page, six, uh, three thousand <laughs> signs. This looks really simple, but uh, and immediately you dip in, in the non-formatted uh, plasma. This, you, you, you could not achieve any single formatted situation without relying on it, actually. So it has a very strange situation because it's actually what I think I use this metaphor in the book, which is if you take, if you take the sub, if, if, if all of the knowledge is the subway, then you have the subway traces, then all the blanks in the subway is the plasma. But of course it's the real reality. It, it's what feeds, it's what allows the rest to work. So if you take an organization, the case of, I'm very obsessed by the question of organization now, uh, no organization would work one minute if it were not constantly drawing on this reserve constantly of un so, so called unformatted, it's just that we don't know what it is, but it's actually of course. And every single organizational theorist immediately has to draw, and it's called, I mean, every generation change, but it, it shows uh, informal connection, it calls uh, interaction, it calls, I mean, every management consultant has to invent one of these, just because it's like buckets taken out of. <laughs> of a plasma, so to speak, to, to fit in and make the machine work. If not, the machine will just stop. And then if you take formalism, I, I just published an article in Social Studies of Science on this fabulous book by Reville Nets on, on, on Greek geometry. Uh, the plasma is everywhere there to obtain the formatting of, 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 of a mathematical uh, demonstration in, in Greek. In Greece, uh, you need a non-formal description. What is the non-formal description of formalism, if not the drawing of a plasma in order to obtain the effect of a demonstration? Which was, of course, missed when people had to fight formalism, because formalism was supposed to occupy the whole landscape. And if you have a formal description of formalism, then the problem, of course, disappears. The whole landscape is occupied by formalism. But if you have a non-formal description of formalism, then the big question is, how do you obtain formalism for one minute? Well, by drawing of non-formal, masses of non-formal, etc., etc. So, uh, plasma is completely, con I mean, it's a, com it's a concept, I, if you want to show where is the plasma, I say, 
everywhere because it is what is not, is the it's the it's the un, it's the uh, it's not unformatted. That's the difficulty here. It is it is what is in between the format the formatting. It's a, maybe it's not a very very good metaphor, but it's a very very different lens. It's the background. Once the background foreground has been reversed and that the sciences have been added to the landscape instead of being what defined the landscape. Uh, another philosopher who was, was very interesting is Peter Schlotterdijk because he has a completely other set of metaphors for that and that it will be the outside of spheres in Schlotterdijk uh, vocabulary. Uh, every, you survive if you are in a sphere, air condition, well of course, but when you are in the air condition you don't see what, what makes the air conditioning work and that would be, you wouldn't call it that plasma, but it would be the same concept. It's what allows the sustenance of a very small pocket of existence in which we are. And again, uh, even more forcefully in, in Schlotterdijk than in myself, the uh, ecological crisis is the, the, the thing that eats the philosophy in an interesting way, so to speak. The really surprising thing about the plasma was how large you said it was. Like the whole of London compared to the networks being really the undergrounds. That was very striking for those who think that your entire world is made up of networks. And there's such a vast mass outside of them. Very quickly. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go back really quickly to um, uh, your discussion about empirical cases and the importance of them in relation to metaphysics. And I wonder if you know you would say that it makes sense um, to say that actors, the actors that populate these cases actually do metaphysics themselves as well in many cases. So, you know, they're relating to produce uh, distinctions between the surface and depth, for example. Mm. Uh, and if that's the case, you know, does it matter for, you know, either the practice of social science or, or metaphysics? Objects doing their own metaphysics. I like that phrase. Um, I'm not sure what to do with it. I've been, I've been working so hard to try to not have myself called a panpsychist. Because everybody assumes if I'm talking about objects relate to each other, I must be saying that objects have minds. And I've been trying so hard to wall that off. And I'm going to have to try to settle this issue once and for all fairly soon. Uh, but I, nonetheless, I'm still drawn to this image of objects doing metaphysics, even if I don't want to say they have minds. And so I, I feel torn in two directions on this one. Can you give an example of objects producing their own distinction between service and death. I don't doubt that there are millions, but it's... you have one of mine? Well, I don't know. Um, the top of my head would be a bit difficult. But, um, um, yeah, I, I've been working on this uh, study in relation to uh, medical imaging and how they get digitized. I think there's an argument that I'm working on that can be made that in the course of that action of digitizing and presenting that the digital version of that image, mm -hmm. a new kind of relation between surface and depth emerges from the relations that are uh, enacted in that situation. Mm -hmm. So um, in that case, then what I'm interested in is that is it would it be possible to say that then you have this, you, you have new foundations, new fundamentals being produced by the actors in, in the occasion. Well, I think that's an important point because that's, that's where I'm worried by the fact that if, if you stabilize this question, which is the relation, I mean, what is really important for, for Graham, which is this connect, do, do actors touch, I mean, do entities touch, one, need to touch one another. If you have to stabilize this vocabulary, you might miss the metaphysics produced by a new entity which is very powerful in digital images, which is a completely new different ways in which background and foreground or pixels and whole are connected. And, and, and that would be a worry. Uh, just to give you one very simple example of which I'm very proud, uh, through my ideas, I ha managed to have uh, the greatest painting in the Louvre, 67 meters square, robbed in the Louvre facsimilated and transported in the original places in Venice without being touched. And the Louvre has not discovered the robbery, which is very funny. <laughs> Through digital technology, we actually managed a second original, which is even more perfect than the first, because it's actually better. 
and it's at the original place. Now, here it's a typical case where the whole metaphysics apparatus has to be mobilized from Benjamin definition of what is an original, what is a copy, what is a subsistence, uh, the whole question of uh, dispute between the original and the copy. The result is that this work by the great artist Adam Lowe first made the Venetian in tears when they saw what they believed was a mere facsimile and realized it was a somewhat original, then realized that the aura of a painting in the Louvre had been robbed. And it's actually now, if you go to Venice, you will notice that the first time, for, not for the older people here, but for the younger, where you see a very great masterpiece without being blocked by endless security guards and something, is now the Nazi di Cana di Veronese in Venice. Not in the Louvre. In the Louvre, it's in the Mona Lisa room, it's surrounded by guards. You can't see it because it's so big that I could be bumped into the Mona Lisa. <laughs> in the Japanese, uh, looking at the Mona Lisa, you cannot see the painting. You are in Venice. Since it's a facsimile, it costs, I mean, it's not even protected. There's no air conditioning. There's no guard. You are alone for the first time in a major work of art. Okay, that's the sort of case where, for me, the whole question of metaphysics about what it is to reproduce, what it is to do facsimile, what is an original, what is a digital technique, are being uh, transported anew and offered for study to the people like us. And that's where me the, the, the positioning of metaphysics might be different. Here it's crucial not to make assumptions about the basic furniture of what original and reproduction is, because, as you mentioned, the digital technology precisely modify entirely, locally, what it is to reproduce something, and what it is to reproduce. I told the guys in the room that they, you didn't even notice that your painting had been robbed. <laughs> this is very odd. They, the people go to Venice and now they flock in the foundation of Sydney to see a real Veronese. It's at its place, for which Palladio made it, it, it's there. So, that's practical, that's empirical metaphysics. I have no good answer to that. It's a dazzling <laughs> but story. But it does give us a good time to break for lunch. Is there, Alexi? Yeah, uh, we have the lunch at the same room so we have the coffee in the morning. And uh, for some reasons, the guys from the catering uh, service asked us to stay in those two rooms. Yeah, because, of, because otherwise you'll get confused with the main LSE yeah. lunch queue yeah. and that will just confuse <laughs> everyone. Yeah. Uh, we're uh, coming back here, we're starting at uh, quarter to one. Yeah. Yes, we are okay. 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 Can we leave our stuff here? Uh, anything you don't want wrong, uh, I would take with you. Yeah, I think we'll... Uh, so that was a scale one reproduction of the original amazing piece. <laughs> the biggest thing in the world, that is one of the biggest things in the world. And it's, it, it's absolutely stunning to the people are not satisfied with this, uh, what they believe in sexual. Mm. <laughs> 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 the most thing I
two items. One was uh, to take a position, uh, and another was to try and uh, summarize uh, or explicate, amplify some of the points that are written in the morning. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, first be briefly for a couple of moments and then say something about this uh, central uh, question of the experimental physics. And I think, uh, yeah, well, you know, I'd like to say something about that. And then uh, summarize uh, like three points which I think are, are, are crucial, uh, either points of convention or perhaps more productively uh, points to, uh, to, to grapple with and struggle with. Um, on, this, on the point of experimental metaphysics, I uh, feel that I need to, uh, to stand up for actual network theory a little bit. Uh, in the sense that uh, there is there is one aspect of extra network theory which I think is a is a very important challenge uh, to metaphysics or or intervention in metaphysics uh, that yeah that, that maybe hasn't had uh, so much attention didn't get so much attention before. Um, and that is the, the point that, that active network theory is a particular style of uh, doing event thinking. Um, and because Graham says, well, the all this process philosophy business, uh, I'm glad to keep Latour or active network theory uh, in a different camp. It is something I think that doesn't always come out. And maybe um, uh, the Latour himself has shifting methods to a different terrain that of the most of existence also has made lost interest in this question of, of or less, less interest in this event aspect um, of early earlier action network theory. Why do I think that it's important? On the one hand, I think it's important for the simple reason that um, by uh, focusing on uh, actors as events, and by uh, studying translation as an event, which is something that the brain does say specifically in the book. Um, by doing that, actual network theory actually pushes uh, process philosophy, I think, and, and also event thinking um, in a particular way. Um, and what, what actual network theory adds in that respect that I think is important is that it says, as soon as we say that we're not going to address the question of what is, but we're going to instead uh, um, uh, take as our starting point stuff that is happening, as soon as you make a shift, you, in a sense, you suspend uh, ontology. So the point of the flat ontology, the point of the symmetry between humans and non-humans, is also, in a way, in academic theory, a way of undoing ontology. And I do think that Graham is right to say yes, but to really make use of ANG, we have to reconstitute uh, an, an ontology, or perhaps its ontology. But I think that in doing it, absolutely crucial to it, um, for, I think, two reasons. We should think about our time. Um, one thing I think um, is relevant that why does A and C need to undo ontology and say we start with this block of humans and non humans, this amorphous uh, field, completely unelegant and unarticulate? Yeah, un it is because they are studying change. They are studying change in a technological society. If that is what I understand economic theory was about. It was about saying we have a world where continuously new entities are added to the arrange of, of existing entities, everything continuously changes, and yet in this modern technological world, everything continuously stays the same. We have these stabilized regimes, um, we have these black boxes that are impossible to open. How is it possible that <coughs> that's supposed to be the case? Um, and this, I mean, to, to, to address that question, you then have to look at how ontologies are articulated in events or, or in practice. Um, well, I really think I shouldn't, uh, because of course I have all these other things that uh, seem to be relevant, but I should probably uh, wrap up and basically say that 
this is an aspect of the academic period that I think is very important, and I think that by shifting too quickly into an object metaphysics, we might risk losing some of the progress made there. Um, and also, I think in if, if Latour says, I'm going to do now an metaphysics of the song, I can see that you get a more high res uh, philosophy um, that way than by saying we're going to look at all these events of which we understand so little. Um, but well, that is uh, I think the point I wanted to flag. And then uh, three points of discussion. I, I tried to summarize them really uh, quickly, and, and uh, maybe in discussion that can be some more um, can be elaborated. Uh, there's three points. The first is uh, ontology epistemology, the relation between them or the continuity between them. Because again, in actual network theory, one of the important points was to problematize or perhaps in some cases suspend that distinction. So by showing how from the description of entities we could get to the realization uh, and the existence of an entity. Um, and I think that may also be important for the practice of philosophy itself, where philosophy, in order to think, does not need to say we are thinking exclusively ontology or exclusively epistemology, because that um, way of carving up the philosophical universe may also be actually an artifact of the age of human access. Uh, that, that very much think rightly want to um, well, move beyond. Second point is about the social and the political versus the metaphysical that um, I think in Gray's uh, book, the political erupts an interesting uh, moment and sometimes does things that maybe the author uh, is also uh, uh, surprised by. But there are also points where, where politics, politics becomes a, a model. So, for instance, the democracy object, where politi politics is taken as a model and subsumed as a model in that physics, and I think it's a question that other external formulated as well. Um, so, so, what do you do with that? Um, the last point is maybe about the, 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 the uh, a heart of, of at least a matter. Uh, and mainly the um, definition of object. Because I think that when Graham says what my book does is to show that a theory of specific objects is where metaphysics has uh, to answer. This is a challenge that metaphysics will not take on. Um, how to do, how to theorize, how to engage specific objects. But that um, that might uh, have, I mean, if metaphysics is faithful, it discerns what is an object that wants to change, can be different. And um, the fact that in, in the, the description of actual network theory, we continuously encounter action, forces, effects, um, and even at one point it states very clearly an object is an effect. But if in the study of specific objects we 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 do not find this singularized uh, thing that's well put together as an object, we do not find that foundation, <coughs> but we find it as an emergent effect. So a star system as an emergent effect, uh, an, an architectural building as an emergent effect. How how can metaphysics take in that that kind of object and still be an object oriented I think force Star system and the architectural uh, building. The, the, let's take the yeah, one of those fancy ones that are common places in the VR. That's very special space. A little bit more. Thank you so much. Can you respond now or wait? Which is better? See whether you want to reach your attention to flex on other questions. No, I might as well just deal with them now. Um, yes, actually, that we're doing might be a style of event thinking, but it's the sort of event 
there's a punctuated event. It's not just kind of slow and coming to get to the primary feature of other flows. Uh, in this philosophy, you can have long stretches of time when nothing happens, but not just time. Time does not exist until near a personal situation is created. So if you want to use the word process philosophy, what he's doing is fine. I just don't want to be confused with his particular ability. I don't want them all marks in the baskets, because I don't think there's much to get it. Um, I'm not, okay, I know we disagree about the meaning of this initial move where we put everything on the same footing. We even talked about this in Amsterdam, but we were. Uh, one thing, you think that the starting point, I think it's already the most truth that everything's equally real. I just think things are not equally strong. I think they are all equally real. But another starting point is that you think the motive for that was to focus on change. Well, I, I don't know what the real psychological motive was, but it's, it's within the context of the theory, what is the, the point of doing it? I think it's more a way to focus on individual actions. Uh, you can't focus on individual actors if you start with the primary difference between what kinds of real and what kind, kinds aren't. There are certain real physical entities and other pigments that even mind project under those, which Bruno did not uh, destroy so wonderfully in the middle of the body. Now, I shouldn't use that word. So, yeah, I have a different reading of the importance of that move. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's so much about it. Um, I'm telling you, this analogy relation is pretty easy to handle because I, I don't believe it's using it. I'm more traditional in that way. I do think there's a distinction because I think this analogy has to do with relations, and of course, I think the things themselves are outside the nation. Uh, these two points, social and political thing. Actually, I'll bring those points we're all taking, especially because I, I usually don't like correlating ontological positions with political ones. I usually hate when people do that. People assume that relationality means progressive Western politics and substance means. Impressive reaction in color. <laughs> <laughs> I really hate that as a function. Um, and so maybe I think I was too a careless in the manuscript in, in equating ontological democracy with political democracy. Although I think that connection is there in real work. Right? It, it, uh, those two are often spoken of in the same register, especially in the politics of nature. That democracy does seem to be the form of government that's capable of dealing with these actors that don't know what each other are, mm -hmm. each other into account. And then after after I've made this point about the non-progressive forces, Nietzsche and God, who, who seem to be made influenced by their induction, I started thinking this could, could you have a totalitarian reading of that generic theory? Pick it up for the theory and start to let the stronger actors prevail. <laughs> um, I don't know, yeah, so I don't know. I, I should have been a little more careful with that connection of ontology and politics, so I think. Uh, the last point was about complicated objects. I'm not sure I got the question. It's an interesting, it's an interesting theme, but I'm not sure I got what the problem was. How would it be so much harder to take a kind of complicated one than a traditional one that forces and buckets? And, 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 and Aristotle talks about comments. Well, it's, it's two, two different uh, things uh, at stake there. I think one has to do with complicated objects uh, um, doing something with the metaphysical uh, mode of defining what an object is. So, object objects continuously disturb definitions of what they are supposed to be. So, how um, how do you um, well, how, what do you do with that? But the second point is about the, the second way in which it, what I meant, and maybe I wasn't uh, clear enough is that um, in the, in the next second last part of the book, there seems to be a situation, uh, um, the situation comes about as, as if Latour does objects that are effects, which are only their attributes, which are therefore mere surface, and then you step in to uh, say uh, that and, and give it substance again. Um, and, and that sort of um, bifurcation, if you want, uh, yeah, it's, that seems to be a way in which object oriented philosophy society cannot do one of the things that it should do, namely take these complicated objects of which, which are both, which are emergent, um, and take those as a 
as the sort of the wordy object of, uh, of an object or in the book. So you, yeah, you've got these complex emergent things in half and say there's some surface in this system. But I'm also doing that with simple things. I'm doing that with chairs and points and so on. Yeah, that's kind of mine. I would agree that, of course, complicated objects are more problematic in terms of what their nature really is. Um, I do want to stick with this classification because again, I want to explain the nature of the object that are resizable. Yeah, but the classification is important. Yeah, because it's 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 important. Yeah, and I think you can avoid that, but if you avoid that, you avoid it by finding everything out too much. So everything is just on the level of the standard station, and that leads to these other two types of paradoxes that I've been talking about before. You can't explain the change of things, and you can't explain the counterfactual situation with other possible observers that can be seen in the vicinity. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure that the complicated objects pose a different sort of challenge than my theory than the simple ones. I have to reject my theory on both levels for the same reason. Yeah. But I, I do agree that, in practical terms, complicated objects pose problems that Aristotle would have thought. I mean, it's hard to mention Aristotle's but if it's covering star systems and the internet and how he could put it. It would be easy for him to say about substance that those are objects. Yeah. You can keep the thought that the substance is simple by decree and not deal with it. Not deal with the complicated ones. But I think you mentioned that you mentioned somewhere within the heart of the argument in Black and in time studies that suddenly you complicated objects are more metaphysically interesting because we cannot easily do for them what we do with hammers and with uh, ordinary objects. And that's the point which has always been made by us that science and technology are actually easier to study because they are complication and novelty and such that they are not spread at least at the beginning makes them better candidates to raise new questions like I, I mentioned this morning about the uh, Can I one question? Uh, 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 because usually it's true, I mean this is a common thing in political philosophy, but reactionary uh, thinkers are usually more interested than the progressive in that <laughs> you learn more about politics in uh, people like Machiavelli and Schmidt than in Rousseau, uh, in, and the, with the very few exceptions which I or to a uh, notion like this one is extremely rare. But the, there is no connection, and I think that's the point that this kind of makes, which is quite important, that there's absolutely no connection at all with the idea of the multiplicity of being and any sort of democracy uh, position. Because democracy, again, and, and I think that's something I learned, and I'm working more and more on that, actually, that's why in political science school, it is uh, um, a very, 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 very different type of trajectory, which I call political education, which is completely specific, and which is actually not very much uh, studied by people interested in democracy, which have, you know, as a rule, a part of the great pragmatist tradition, uh, a very epistemological definition of what it is to be present. So, uh, we should not confuse, and I think that's, that's a great clarification of notice, the, the the idea of multiplicity of being and the abandon of a human non human distinction with any position about how to organize the policy, which is an entirely different question, and we rely on the specification of what is original in, in, in political uh, mode of existence as they come from law, as it is from right. But I'm mean, just remembering about this in nature, I can remember the connection is <coughs> sort of there, that the, the justification of democracy and politics in nature did seem to be for the ontological reason. But that might be a weakness of political nature when he gives this instruction of peace. Nietzsche and Tom, that's the first kind of thing I love to wait and tell the way to the next one. Alright, now the next one. To add one tiny point, um, Nietzsche is not to these complex objects, if you want to reintroduce all questions of metaphysics that uh, got buried. Uh, <coughs> in, in the Kantian uh, age, um, I mean, the que those questions cannot stay the same. You cannot say, okay, now the ice age is over, and uh, I, I take up my my uh, my roots and seeds and and uh, I'll grow the same plants again. And one reason, I think, or the principal reason is, I think, precisely made clear by Ekranet or theory right from the start, namely that the, 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 the industrial world is one 
where uh, the, the, the answer to the question what exists is fundamentally uh, uh, a variable. So it's a dynamic world where suddenly a new element gets added at the periodic table. So it's about, and how can maybe physics turn it into a, something productive rather than challenging? By not spacing the messages on any level that's easy to this room. Um, I, I think the same thing about Bruno's <coughs> and how was very important for, for him and for a number of things in the same break. Um, I would, and I would agree that the metaphysical questions cannot come back in the same form. They have to be modified to the situation and to take hard work. But uh, they don't need to be swept away in this agnostic nights when they've been left. And what do you agree about this anyway? This question should be brought back. We need that. We need to make it all politically. No, I'm not That's maybe a good, uh, a good point for me. Uh, when, when I was thinking about uh, posing some problems that would be common to the US and Bruno, uh, I was imagining if, if we accept the idea that Bruno has a, a medical, a medical medicine, and you have a hypergolian medical, uh, then the question that came up in my mind is, can we make this metaphysics act in the practice of doing research? In other words, put more pragmatically, does it make a difference in the sorts of things that I might do <coughs> when I do my experiments? Uh, and if it doesn't, then uh, maybe the metaphysical question is not an important question. In the uh, and can be set aside. Uh, so we don't have to start our pieces by writing our chapter on metaphysics before we do the description. If, if it does make a difference, then uh, in a way I would be interested to know what that difference would be. Uh, the, the other question that, if you read many of the questions, <coughs> I think that is very clear is that there is a, the point that Bruno made earlier to say that the, one of the flaws in the reduction was that it had difficulty explaining trajectory, or not explaining, but accounting for trajectory. Uh, and the, in, in, his, uh, in his address to the British Sociological uh, Association, he said, um, at the same time, the great weakness for theory to claim that every mode of the connection is specific, while at the same time not being able to say in what way each mode differs from each other. Uh, also, also touches on this question of uh, trajectory and uh, duration, that durability, that although every event is specific, there is some continuity between events. Because if that wasn't the case, everything would be unprecedented, uh, everything would be, have to be done from scratch. It would be like uh, uh, natural scientists repeating the same experiments again and again and again because they've learned nothing from any previous experiments. Clearly they have. So something carries over from experiment to experiment. So even though, although we have serial description, the serial description is not every time from scratch. Description take something from, from previous description. If we take the description of the, or the experiment as description of the, uh, uh, in the experimental metaphor uh, in use. So it seems to me uh, one of the important consequences of that is that you do end up, as Bruno acknowledged, you do end up with a, a problem of giving an account of some metaphysics in which you have to give an account of different mode of existence. Uh, and, and in a sense, is the account of different modes of existence an acknowledgement that happiness is theory means uh, metaphysics? So, I'll leave those. Yes. <laughs> um, I, 
I will begin to apply probably in the children of punctual or uh, because I wonder if it's true even of the most traditional uh, actor network theory. Is that the uh, most reminder of the notion of events and we imagine it's always a beginning of the trajectory to vector. We all, I mean, it seems to me that I've always been interested in vectors. So, no matter how small the point we take uh, of study is, it has actually uh, a vector uh, quality. Now, immediately in the old days of the, what you said, the consequences, I, I think, we bought the warning, uh, global warning. Uh, the idea is uh, we, we, we could not really uh, capture this, uh, this, this vector, vector of uh, notion because we had to, we were, I mean, uh, bifurcated by this might and right uh, division of materials and so on. But now it's quite possible to do the vector. So the second point you made is, is that actually I think now it's quite interesting to see that uh, what, when you say carries over from one moment to the next, the carrier is, for me, the what I want to say. So, mm -hmm. the type of carrier is very different if it's a small van or if it's a bicycle or if it's one of these guys who are bringing pizza to you and, 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 and so on. And that's what, for me, in the old days, I defined the hard, the paradigm of information system <laughs> is precisely how many ways they are carrying out those from the time to the next. But this was invisible if you should cover, I mean, this is the point of start against work out again. If you suppose that there exists a society that carries this fear. So the, the enormous weight to maintain the existence to the subsistence uh, is immediately replaced by a substance which lies behind it. And that's, of course, the, the difficulty uh, I have with the, with, on which I'll come back uh, on the part the, as, 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 as hard set to uh, steal to by location. Now, the first point you made, what difference does it make in terms of uh, empirical uh, research? Uh, it makes a whole difference if actors or events are not allowed to have their own necessity. Because it means that you basically, my problem with the social sciences is that the repertoire that we accept in the world of action, of theory of space, of theory of time, of definition of what is an individual, of a whole basic furniture uh, of, the, of the world is much, it is it, set in advance. You're supposed to have, I mean, to read, uh, uh, even critical uh, theory, the, the, the list of what is supposed to exist is what you take. So, well, I'm very interested in religion. I can say that anthropology of religion is no use to me. Because they begin by saying, of course, the, all of these gods and divinity are, of course, not there. They, they cannot be part of existing entities. What the use of doing any study in anthropology of religion is to fix the, the first, uh, at the beginning, uh, and say, well, of course, you know that all these sections are just representations of my people. So I think you never use this book for study of this. Actually, it's also very It's one of the issues where construction and reality is actually happening. So, this is, what, this, this is why for me, I mean, maybe it's again a, a very nuance between what, uh, I mean, it's a professional position as well. I mean, I, Again, I run into the woods by <laughs> following this. This, 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 this. Oh. <laughs> 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 thing, oh, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> uh, and and that, that, but I think it's quite important that then then I become a really major citizen in the very simple sense of saying if you don't read the philosopher, even and don't read the wrong one, read read the, the wise one. <laughs> if you don't read the wise one. Whenever you have someone who comes to you and say, use my favorite example, I come here because this fabricate is better God, you will be stuck. You will have no resource to understand the extraordinary inventor inventivity of this lady who comes to a convent to fabricate God, because you're supposed to separate fabrication and belief. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a bit it's the same with the biological story uh, as I said this morning. So, of course, better position, better professional better position might be to that because it's a bit of a toolbox. And say, well, because it is more serious than just allowing you to do field work. And, and I think they're right, because then once you have done the field work, you might feed back from the field work to the deputy. And my study of practices, so for kids figure in terms of inventing new terms, and running another round of social construction in the water again. But, 
what exactly matters. Okay, now that we have understood what that is possible for actors themselves to articulate in a sense the constructivism as a cause of reality, what does it change on the study of religion? Of course, we are in general, even more in general, in the of time, about what I could say about religion. But this, this, what for me is this travel back and forth, which I would call the physical health of the people. And of course, again, none of us will produce studies, uh, I mean, professionally publishable uh, metaphysics in drawn in mind or in produce metaphysics. Everything like that here. Yeah, two things. First of all, I'm still not sure how you get the vector that you say a thing happens at one time and one place only, which is one of the saying all that introduction is one of them, Because things are punished. <laughs> they just, they just, I mean, they are, you, have you ever seen a punk for it? Which is not sense, which is not carried, which is not, I don't know, it's not hours. I don't see it, but now you're just talking about pointing at something else. I was talking about trajectory across time, which is a different thing. No, it's, 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 it's what golfing at this moment and that moment. I'm, I'm surprised by this reading of, of, of the punctuality. I don't think that the spirit of the next one, the whole different network is, is something that happens. Mm-hmm. Not because it's in time, but because it's at this moment and that moment. That's part of the different question from time. And if you say the thing happens in one time and one place only, you are saying that it's cut off functionally. And it's but I'm not saying it happens once, I think it happens once. It's a weird use, it's a weird use to her. It's not exactly the same way. Did you say that it happens more than once? That's what I wanted to make that sense. That's not necessarily me. He said it once in one second. As far as what difference can make, <laughs> I was asked a question also by Baha in the November lecture, what, 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 what implications of this have for method? And I didn't really have a good answer to that. I've been thinking about that a little bit since then. I mean, I, so people do the field work to see if they read this book and are inspired to try the method. I, I don't know what that would be, but one, one thing I sometimes suspect is that the method of hidden substances would be better for counterfactual situations. And I, I don't want to just throw that out there in case there are people in AMP already doing that and I'm consulting their work by not knowing about it, but it, it just seems to me that. Uh, thinking of things as events and as relations is better when they've already happened. It's more than sort of when they've already happened. And you look at what the factors were. But to imagine, you know, how would this day have been different if we had added the following people to the audience? You know, Zizek, um, my brother, and, you know, some third person. How, what, what my, one of the things might have happened today that didn't happen. What sorts of questions might have been asked that didn't? Uh, I think you can't really do that if you look at today just as an event made up of the action theory made it possible. It's a little more than that, too. It's, there's also something that is created by those, all those actors that exceed the actors, uh, which other actors could have come and cut off and added to. And I don't think that's completely really nonsensical. Uh, historians can kind of try to discuss that. But can I, can, can I say anything about those? There is this very story of Handage and Decamante and Petition of Deleuze, where it's always struck me very much, which is the lightning. When the lightning strikes, suddenly the lightning and the, the night is visible. So, you, you dismiss, I, I'm surprised because the laws make a whole lot of the difference between potentiality and virtuality, mm-hmm. and the opposition between potential and real and virtual actual. So, the two proper. And, and you say this is, this is air splitting or something. I mean, you, you say it's not, not, not everybody who's supposed to solve the problem I have in mind. That, that's why, because then it seems to me that uh, 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 it is that a way out of the actualism argument that potential real is really the enemy, because, and, and that's why I said one thing right once on me. But once again, I, I mean, I, I read my videos quite carefully at the time, and we have the same uh, narration for TV, is that the potential real means that real is nothing, because everything is already potential, and the real is just uh, really a, a, a small deformation. And we know that very well in information system, in management, in epistemology, in uh, politics, and so on. I mean, the, the give, us, give me a potential to be people. But if you do, if take the other couple, which is uh, uh, virtual uh, and actual, actually it's a bit of a misnomer because of the actualism argument, uh, it is a very, very, very different type of connection. If the, the striking light, lightning, 
uh, which is simultaneously there, I and mean, it's a completely positive point, and yet the neutrality are uh, accompanied. This is the Deleuze argument when he said before the, uh, the flowers are there, the sun is not the cause of the flowers. It's only once the flowers have appeared that the causality of the sun becomes extremely important. So the cause, the flowers goes back, so to speak, inside the causality uh, of, 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 of the sun. So the difficulty is, is that if you take an analysis uh, point, it is very difficult to articulate that. I agree with you. And there is an actualism uh, it. And that's what I, I consider the main mistake of the limitation of the uh, reduction. But it, it's not the same thing as to say that things are not vectors, because being a vector is what it is. To be is to be trying to survive on something because you can act with something, you can take anything of this. So the functionality, I think it's unfair to talk about the functionality, because functionality, what, what, would, what, what would it be a functional event? I, I can't really understand it. It would be something which has no ascendance, no dissonance, no wish to survive, no anything. It would be what? You can't create time by bombing from Conocus. Conocus could in principle be in a moment. It might be hard to visualize, but there's nothing in Conocus that says there has to be a slow of time. It's kind of like Not a slow, but uh, mm-hmm. the dissonance. No, there just has to be an outward directedness, and that could happen functionally. It doesn't, have, that doesn't imply that there's any unfolding of time. For you, time is created by actors. That's not the case for Bertrand. Time right. is not created by actors. But, but uh, 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 Rabbit's of a, a kid. Yeah, but. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it, it, may, it may that every the vector quality <laughs> is really what actor network tries to grasp in, in some sort of sense. I mean, badly, I agree, badly with the notion of the election, but. But wasn't it also the point that in order for uh, an object to happen or to come about, um, you have the building of the trajectories, you have the. Uh, I mean, if you. I think that of, of John Law, who wrote his paper on, on the uh, properties, like lo- long distance control uh, in the Portuguese sea trade. But it's all about how these uh, sea routes came about, how the ships came about, how the ships could be, uh, you know, how, how they could figure out navigation, uh, all this stuff, which is all the all the things that are actually part of the story of uh, spice trade. So if you want to get um, the spices, you have to take that whole trajectory, uh, that whole uh, circulatory range of into account. By talking about an object happens only one time in place, and op- an actor is concrete, that whole aspect uh, is it 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 lost from view. You see, but then, then it suddenly becomes a myth, then all sorts of things become mysterious. If you, if you don't consider this trajectory building aspect that is part of that it's like essential to the certain edge of objects in the But the trajectory can't be created by outside actors, right? It's an outside actor who sort of determines that the thing is the same thing as it was. No, things are like a second. I mean, you, you said I'm a secret of right? Secular occasion. So, I, ha, 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 ha is in every single expectant occasion, right? For secular, if I'm secular. Every single entity is expectant of the next step. Not expected, but it becomes a possible mediator of any other two entities. Well, that's all it says. Now we're talking about the thing it says. It is expected. It is expected. No? I don't think it's expected. I don't know whether it's expectation is going to be a problem. <laughs> I don't think it's all the time problem. I think it's a silly definition. But um, I want to say something about virtual. Uh, the reason I'm never impressed by philosophies of the virtual, whether it's Carlos or Delanda or, or a few times I've reviewed in conversation, is it's an attempt to shift the action away from the individual objects put it somewhere else. And all these individual objects are already completely deployed, they're sterile, they're on the surface. Let's move things somewhere else. Why? Why do we have to think that the individual objects lack this power? Why does everybody agree that the individual objects have nothing else to deserve? I agree that it's not potential because I think the call of something has potential means potential to relate those things, which I want to stay away from. It's got to be something that it has in its own right. But why call it virtual? Why not just grant each thing that non related depth? But this is what occasion is all about. If it's, if it's not a causality, it's occasion which means there is an enormous reserve for other occasions. 
he was he, he, one, one chloroform, chloroform, chloroform he invented, the son never imagined that chloroform was invented. The son is not the cause of chloroform. Now the chloroform is here, now the son is the cause of chloroform. But there are lots of other things that Charles can do. This is retroactive causality, not occasional causality. I think there's a difference. So the occasional causality has to be a real, a real situation where something is linking to other things. This retroactivity, I think, is somewhat different. I'm not sure I can articulate it. So, am I in a question? I like it that it's, it's, it's a small vector is still a vector. can be very small, but still has an hour at the end. But that doesn't mean it's only that bad at the moment of time. It just means that well, it does look very carefully into how it runs to this moment, but there's no substance anymore. See, that's a big part of philosophy. If you think so, substance was a very nice way of solving all our questions, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the primary and secondary qualities floating around, and substance was doing the job of subsistence. Okay, we took substance away. Now, why did we do that? Might might be disputable, and I, I think in this building there will be lots of people who will dispute it. So substance would be. Now, okay, we have now a fair way of subsistence. And if you want to do that, it means that you have to be very, very worried constantly about how you are going to pay the way. If a horse, and that's Darwinian argument in the, in, in the sense of, if a horse is not there to subsist, uh, to make this, the horse and subsist, every horse has to do its own grading, so to speak. But that's true also for this and that and here and everywhere. Now, what I add to that is that there might be many, many, I mean, not many, fortunately, not many, uh, different ways of grading. But the vector of quality, the expectancy, expected, expectancy of being, seems to be a common theme, I mean, which is very difficult to take off. Uh, the whole of the philosophical tradition, because then the notion of an atomic event which has no successor or no predecessor is not that something we learn from uh, atomism, I mean from the epicurean, I mean it, 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 it's not something which allows already as, as the skeptic, skepticism in view. Is, is this something is it, is the atomism already dealing with the skepticism? Is it bad, is it bad already a long history of philosophy behind you when you get the idea that you have atoms? Oh, well, sure, but it's fairly late in the pre Socratic tradition. You know, it's just the Jewish sheep that air and water and air and fire and water mixed by another hate. And atomism is almost the last stage that is contemporary with Socrates himself. Um, but it's the one that's trying. It's the one of pre Socratic philosophy that has tried. And it's taken a common sense down. It's not a certain long time to make it out of a scene like common sense. In terms of Heidegger, it's the Heidegger talks about design as being projected, always already projected, always already expected, mm -hmm. that we anticipate the future. We don't simply walk out the door and be surprised by what's about other other side of the door. In walking through the door, we already anticipate what's on the other side of the door. Uh, what you're suggesting is, uh, which I think you would support, is the idea that all actors are expected, all actors are projected. But, is it? We 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 underestimate it by saying expected because how is it is expected, but of course it is expected in as much as it, is, it has a certain sense in which it it is it's been it's mode of existence. And here I want to interject and say Heidegger is an absolute occasion that Heidegger has no theory of time despite time being in the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can say pretty easily why there is this, this projection of Heidegger that doesn't give him time. He's that's proof of what I'm talking about. Because there are Heidegger and there's some time. For Heidegger, if you're talking about succession of instance, that's the whole weird theory of temporality, right? Uh, if, if, if we're talking about death, you talk about an actual date on the calendar when you're going to die, that's the whole concept of death. <coughs> uh, the real concept of death means the death that influences you right now. The right. conclusions you're performing is what you're doing right now. And the future and past that are authentic future and past for Heidegger are the ones in the right now. It's not anything having to do with a stream of time or a flow of time or even a vector. It, well, maybe color vector. It, it, doesn't, it isn't anything that takes about an instant. That's why he talks about the algorithm at the moment. It's so important for Heidegger's philosophy. Heidegger really is just a philosopher of succession of instants. Um, there is no flow between them. This is why the confusion between Heidegger and Bergson is driving up the wall. It's so different. Uh, everything, it, Heidegger even said that Bergson is guilty of the whole concept of time, the whole chapter of being time. People just ignore that and say, yeah, they agree that you can't break time down into instants. That's nonsense. That's all Heidegger does. Break time down into three statue of poses. He never connects them, which is fine. You can't say, so what sort of location is in them? Is it not a secret? Is it a secret? Absolutely not. Yes, you're on our own.
But then they are on the object, in which case I don't see what, why you would have occasionalism in the first place. Because if you're not relating anything. Because you have a bunch of objects that are related yet. And in order to get them together, you need to somehow find a mechanism by which they fuse into an object. That's the only role that relations really play. Yeah, one thing is the monogram. It's just objects and nothing but objects. And all the objects contain themselves. But how do you agree with the first part of the concept again? Because the fortuitous experiment started by Peter on what difference it makes to the definition. Your answer for me makes sense that then it's conflictory with what I'm interested in. For them, uh, two biologists, uh, Sonigo and Kuchet, write a book on the Yu-Gi-Oh! in Chen, which criticized what we call the Aristotelian version of information as a metaphor for biological systems. The genetic metaphor of information and signals is actually transportation in biology in particular biology of biology of thought, Now, they often, inside biology itself, the, the, the question which should not be settled, which is, what is an organism? What is an organism? And the organism itself, even the, the so they, they, they move from the forest, the body metaphor, the forest metaphor, this question is a huge territory of dispute inside biology because not only because we are made of many cells and the cells themselves are made of many cells but because the very notion of information as transportation of signals might be disputable for we hardcore Darwinian like uh, Sunny is. So here are two different if I think just the answer to uh, what Graham gave you and my answer this, is, this would be my way to, to pursue our uh, uh, emphasis. I would call again metaphysics the question that follows this very interesting book by Sonigo, opening the very question of what is a whole and the, the relation between a whole and a common that We should not close this question too fast. And the people who are in information system, I mean not the information system in this sense, but the, the, the information paradigm in genetics, uh, have closed in biology much too fast what it is an organism is. I mean, that study goes shows very nicely uh, <coughs> Darwinian for the whole organism, but inside the organism they are uh, completely uh, most traditional aristotelism with the supposed people send signals and then send, uh, send uh, uh, the, the mix fun of the, uh, this argument that cell actually wait for a signal before committing suicide and because there is a mass of talent somewhere. So they involve that is basically an important the thing which we never dare put into our management students here because it would be a completely outdated version of what is an organization. And yet they're in organization, and yet they're an anti So my definition of metaphysics is what is the metaphysics? We open this question enough so that we can follow the dispute in this part of the environment. Does that clarify our discussion? But yeah. So that, that's the heart of two different aspects of metaphysics. We need these guys because they precisely provide us with the tools which allow us to keep open inside the most basic hard science question uh, the settlement of that very dispute that you very nicely mentioned. Is that, and I, I need to say Gaia, and then again the whole question of are we organism or inside the organism is the question that's not of open. So this, that's the very practical practical consequences for me of what I would put in this. Listening to all this, I'm trying very hard to understand the Bacturian notion of serial description. <laughs> Which, nevertheless, uh, you accepted and also you have written yourself that the uh, legitimate thing to do uh, is actually description. And yet, what I understand from this discussion is that this is a deceptively simple innocent, probably worse, um, and as far as appearing as void of not only metaphysics, but also other assumptions and choices. And yet, the way to describe here your efforts to understand the vector that you are interested in and trying to reflect the way we all study whatever vector <coughs> we study, it seems to me that it's difficult to say that you can go very far with description. And indeed, what you described here was um, 
a position starting with, with um, in your case, um, uh, hides or, or uh, contains this um, your view about the damage done by social scientists so far, so you want to overcome that. Then choices on the way of your description, not for example to bother with the waste baskets and concentrate on other things, and then going back to making um, metaphysical kind of claims. How can all of this be packaged in descriptions <laughs> of what we do, uh, which of course mystifies um, the whole effort of uh, doing research of understanding? And I think it is important try to attack, to reveal the theoretical, <coughs> the metaphysical uh, questions and how much unpacking to me remains very opaque still because I'm not a philosopher. But uh, um, uh, definitely there, the, the, there is much more than the description and I think it has to be kind of articulated. <coughs> You are basically right. It's uh, actually disingenuous to go with description. Uh, the most typical task in the typical uh, But I will stick to the words uh, because description is the most difficult thing to do. And because precisely it requires all of those uh, skills. Precisely because it requires so much mathematics just to find the right description. If I take this example again, can you imagine that you go to all the laboratories in run uh, in other this computer and the other campus and say that whenever there is a notion of a signal in biology, <coughs> it's a mis it's a misdescription. And it's Aristotle's God which is actually framing here, and that uh, this paper should be rejected from the Lancet for nature of uh dead biology uh, and, 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 and so on. And yet this is what it has said. It's very difficult to describe a biological system. And I'm not talking about describing organization and so on. So, I, I still stick to the idea that, even though I agree, with my social work is slightly disingenuous when Bobber has got the students to information for the second time. But, but uh, it, it is important. It is not theory first decision. The whole theory should be determined, the anti-bad dictates the students, uh, and so forth. Because uh, it, it's not we will be, uh, again, going back to the tradition of the other. So I agree, science is indigenous, and that's not everything can be put But it's a description in the actual sense of the word. Right. And that includes the whole of the mm -hmm. But doesn't that require revealing your starting point? Oh, I do. This is why I go back to a book as the past, this is why I'm in, this is why I'm in, this is why I'm in, I've never hidden that. What I've hidden is what I've hidden is what I've hidden is what I've hidden I agree, I I've been hiding myself and it's been very unfair, but I've always said to do good description, we need to do good with the I mean, that's, that's why this guy is taking care of the with the That's not the description. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I'm not a philosopher, I don't know anything about philosophy. So you've been talking about potentiality and then I think this is mentioned expectancy as well. I don't understand these terms really, to be honest. I mean, what does potentiality mean? Do you by that mean capacity to act? I mean, could, I, could I go as far to suggest that potentiality could be agency and expectancy on some level of intentionality? Or, um, what does that mean? I mean what's the relationship? Well, you notice that Bruno would reject potentiality because he does not reject expectancy. But expectancy for him would be a vector of being something that's pointing outwards. Whereas he always rejects potentiality because this allows a thing to borrow its achievements in advance without paying for them. Uh, Aristotle introduces potentiality to explain exactly things change, things move. Well, sort of doing the same thing. They call out the milk tree. There were these radical philosophers from the Galeans who said, no, a thing only is what it is right now. And so if someone's not building a house right now, it's not a house builder, even if, you know, even if they have expertise that they're sleeping, they're not a house builder because they're not doing it right now. Aristotle says, this is absurd. Because this implies that an educated, sleeping householder is the same as a totally ignorant householder. <laughs> some, some way has to be made to account for the difference between those. And the, the, the potentiality is very important to I actually tend to reject it at the moment. We're not right because I think it's an attempt to avoid the question of where that potentiality lies in the actual. What is it in the actual that makes it able to do this? In Bruno's case, you have to show step by step the translations, which makes a lot of persons build the house. 
can't say it has its magic potential like that. Uh, for him, him, every step of the translation is very important. Uh, saying that something, saying that the oak tree was potentially in the acorn means that you can skip the difficult question of what all the phases were. I think he said it was a beautiful image in there, though. It's as stupid as saying that the dessert is in the recipe. It's more controversial that all the all the proofs of Euclid are in the axioms, which some people think, many people think they are. Uh, but, but really, you have to spell out each step of the translation, uh, do the work on each step to show it. And I think that's what this book is all about. Right? I'm about to agree with that. Okay, so uh, we, we both reject the Sergioli, but the intention of everything, I think you were accepting it. It's, it's I thought it was this is intentional. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I was saying you can't have an urge in the center of everything is fine. Sorry? How? Well, it has some sort of extent low expectancy. <laughs> <laughs> That's because it was not quite as much agency either. I mean, it's actually a lot of work to make it uh, low expectancy. Cheap, uh, what we call cheap. So it gains it from some other aspect to a relationship. Yes, but it's pointed now to this. And uh, actually, uh, ecology is interesting because now this low and cheap expectancy, I mean, this cheap product can be redesigned in very interesting ways now. So that it, it has another intentionality, so to speak. The cheapness of it, or the recyclability re of the, all these words which are interesting now, the Jura, sustainable. So immediately you see another metaphysical object going on. I mean, if we have to be sustainable, if we have to be uh, politically correct, the ecology is correct. Uh, again, the, the shift between agency, uh, and it's not just us. I mean, it's not we humans projecting on that thing. We actually produce very, very different objects now. And we are going to redesign really all of our projects. So, intentionality is a good word if it's actually if it's extended to everything. Yes, we learn that too. In case of the VR board, we misunderstand the other VR board. Skim only a surface of it. I know this part. Yeah, I can read it. I just bump into it and just see how staggering I have a VM board. But it's more like to, to talk about <coughs> the intentionality of the cost to having one of the implant uh, technology studies we did with the Ford. Yeah, the Ford. It affords certain things. I mean, it can't fly. You know, there are many things it can't do, but it affords certain things. It was designed to support certain things, and in that sense, uh, that is potential is what? Potential. Intention. So it's the same. I mean, how can we give, do we not give it cognitive ability to convey intentionality? No. Because I think that's just that particular. But I don't think all of this is a good term, because I mean, what worries me really is that it's our intention is to convey it, but once it's built, it's supported. It's not, it will not exist. But the short answer is yes, there's a, there's a big controversy over this, of whether you got intentionality or not implied in that site, this concept is very much alive. Some people say yes, some people say no. Yeah. Well, I've got time for one, maybe two quick questions that will have short answers. I would like to link uh, the question back to the uh, data case that came in yesterday in the election, because I'm wondering if some notion that plasma that is mentioned before today is good if it would be called more understandable if it's a conventional spatial way of writing even and spatial way of also of representing the data or the descriptions uh, that we kind of get it like a, 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 a way of, of assembling and this is something that I that if you look at examples of cartography uh, of uh, mapping there is a, there is no so I mean the spatiality of the this, this, um, this medium is allowing a lot of um, I mean, it makes the government, for example, for me, perfectly understandable all of a sudden, much more than reading and over-reading the text about the government media, uh, like, I promise also a question about this, and it is, like, for example, like, I have a question today about it, because technically all of everything becomes possible, but it's the same question of kind of where of this, what, what is included in the, in the map? And what is kind of left as, what is the plasma in the cartography? That's a very important question for everybody involved in it. The data case and, 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 and mapping. And I was wondering if this is something that could be just more spatial way of organizing, if this could be linked back to also a different type of writing about this issue you have dealing with. Where is the plasma and cartography? It sounds interesting. I'm not sure I have it yet, though. 
for me there is, yeah. Because if, if you, even if you, if you kind of met all sorts of uh, assemblages of, 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 uh, of kind of visual way of describing the different, uh, different uh, elements of the spectrum of sound, but, but at the same time there is always a kind of what they call the gap of the outfall, which is the unknown which is kind of there, but it's not, it's not yet included in the network because it's not known yet how it is linked, for example. And there are certain uh, map makers, <laughs> so to say, who, for example, develop ways like how could we also represent this type of data, even if it is kind of unknown to this point, because it's not linked, we just, you know, we represent that it's, it's a matter of representation. So there is a But you found that Google itself came in. Yeah. And then, at just at the time when uh, we were finally catalogued as a good metaphor for the antenna, yeah. Google Earth came in, and then we lost it entirely because now the zoom is so yeah. easy that people have been in front of the catalog, but not is the territory again. <laughs> so, yeah. the, uh, I love uh, Google Earth, but uh, even for yourself, I'm going to read it. actually is misplaced on Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> but you all said it's misplaced on Google Earth, so I want to thank you. But, the navigation of Google Earth is actually a counter to what you said because it's now, it seems to me that the, the zoom is what the world is, is about. Okay. So we are now a sort of scientific equivalent in geography of the internet of zoom, which is very important. And just at the time when precisely the art and, and the production of maps were uh, freeing us from the idea that the map was important. And that's the precise goal. I mean, if there are any other questions, then no. No, I mean, I think there are many other questions than there are questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take advantage of being this way. Uh, I, I, I was very interested in the, the problem of trajectory, and uh, one of the interesting things for me in, in attending the social, what you do early on is you make a distinction between transportation and transformation, and you make it very clear that to mediate is, is, to, is to transform. Uh, but later on, when you get to the next chapter, you bring, you bring in transportation again, when you talk about uh, form. So, uh, one of the things I was thinking uh, is whether uh, it would not be more appropriate to say that translation always transport and transform at the same time that there is always a residual in the translation and it's exactly this residual in the translation which is transported rather than transformed that provides the basis of continuity uh, and going back to the experimental uh, metaphor uh, when, a, when a social science experiment is set up uh, the next, next experiment obviously doesn't replicate that experiment but takes some residual which might be the data, might be some of the experimental setup or something, into the next experiment. Uh, but transforms the experiment and translating into some new, uh, new experiment. So, uh, would this not be a way to, to account for the, the continuity, the trajectory, by admitting from the start that all translations transform and translate? Oh, sorry, transform <laughs> and transform. At the same time. Well, but rather than there are many ways to be continuous and discontinuous. And, and the reference chain, which I've been naming for many years, immuted with mobile, uh, are one very, very specific way of being transported and transformed. And as I said, a legal uh, connection that has actually no continuity. I mean, it's one. Because it is, it is discontinuous, but it doesn't have the same uh, continuity either. And it would be again very, very different from uh, the Darwinian uh, genealogy of uh, the rabbit and the genealogy of the, the acorn and, 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 and the shed. So, it is true generally that uh, the enemy here is clearly the information of the truth, where there will be no transformation. Mm -hmm. But uh, then, for instance, to qualify and to specify the fact that this is and it's very difficult to provide inside information theory now, instead of information, because it, it, it is very used at very strange speed. And I'm not talking about religion and politics, because I don't need to be more bizarre. And organization is a 
Mozilla and all of those put together. So uh, I don't use actually translation very much too, because I mean that's that's done basically. Uh, the question of specifying the type of discontinuity and continuity is very much what I'm trying to do now. And it, it is very I find it very, very difficult. Uh, of course, the, 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 in the history of philosophy, the whole, the whole the shibboleth, the whole benchmark was the kind of demonstration. That's why I think this book by me, Rebel Mess, is absolutely crucial for the history of philosophy. Because it's the first time we have a first hand, in first hand, 24th century before, after uh, account of what a non formalist kind of formalism is. And it shows very nicely that Plato actually didn't know that much uses this idea of transportation without information as the ideal way of speaking of all the big questions of philosophy. Which for which they, 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 the next shows that that's an exquisite detail. The geometers, the two and a half geometers born every year for two centuries, were extremely careful to make absolutely no meta meta mathematical He arrives Plato a makes a big Hollywood that's the <laughs> uh, and, and, and now we have another way, now we get into the, the Agora, and we have another way of speaking, which is the transport of without information. So, it, it, it's true that uh, this notion of information without transport is, and I think I, and I, think I, and I, think I was right there, very young, to say this is immutable and abiding. That's the crucial thing, and I should spend the first year trying to. But I could not understand the vast between on, on geometry, Greek geometry, and really net easy stuff as well. Because my website was always on. But one can see the, the effectiveness of transportation without transportation. Yes, <laughs> it's substance. Yeah. It's all a question of duration. It's all a question of political order. It's all a question of law. I mean, it, it, the Greek way would be silly not to do this. And yet, what really is that true is that, in fact, the, the allusion to geometry in the whole Greek corpus are extremely so. Medicine everywhere, law everywhere, politics everywhere. Geometry and mathematics is only in the eyes of the hand and, 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 and the paper. It's very, very small in that culture. That was so striking. I mean, you couldn't resist. The Greek, I mean, as I said, the Greek invented demonstration and uh, politics in the and the kids have not worked out how to in a hurry to invest in this But we should not mix it. Roger, do you want to make a final comment? <laughs> no, that's it. <laughs> no, no, that's it. Okay. Graham? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say thanks again to the answer to people. And one thing that Peter and I have been joking about some of my work. Uh, this event almost proves Bruno's theory, and this proves mine, because none of the actors involved were very strong by themselves. It took many different people and in the manuscript itself, and many different organizers in the room, and all sorts of different agents had to come together and make this event a reality. And I want to thank everybody who was part of that. It's an amazing experience watching this develop over the last four or five months. Uh, the series of incredible coincidences that have occurred for this thing to happen, and I'm very happy that it happened as it did, and all you came. Just to, to sum up, I was kind of in, scribbling down various notes and just some of the metaphors and images that I kind of picked up. So we've had the industrial uh, uh, model of truth, we've had vicarious occasionalism. Bruno has admitted he's an old fashioned positive, positivist, he's also a Darwinist. Uh, he doesn't have four of the answers. Uh, Irreduction is one of at least 14 potential uh, modes of existence. We've had discussions about Twilio's eyeballs and eardrums. We've had concern about serial re-describers that were careful, not serial killers. We've had a little bit of uh, discussion about art themes. And I think towards the end of the discussion, we made a nice point that the, the common enemy, the common question that we've been addressing has been this idea of the information double click, the transformation without uh, any, uh, tra transportation without transformation. And the question has always been about keeping open the question, not pre-assuming any of the things that, uh, we've, that we want to be looking into, because that, that, that leads to a, a, an academic policy. And I think very much both Bruno's work over the years and Graham's book that 
trying to tighten up, question, explore some of those things has been a very useful step in keeping open many of these questions. It's all too easy to, to take shortcuts to and 